Um, my name is Dan Kidder. I'm the Chief Instructor of On-Target Defensive Training. I've been a uh, firearms instructor for 21 years. I used to be an instructor at the FBI Academy at Quantico, and I was an adjunct instructor at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center at Glencoe, Georgia, as well as an instructor at the NRA headquarters in Fairfax, Virginia. And I've taught uh, let law enforcement all over the country, uh, federal agents all over the country, just about every federal agency that you've ever heard of, I have instructed their officers and their agents, including Camp Period and the Central Intelligence Agency. So uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been teaching the Virginia, the Virginia. I taught in Virginia for a long time, so I'm sorry. I've been teaching the Utah Concealed Firearms Permit course for about nine years. Um, this room is uh, donated to us by the owner of the building to use uh, whenever we want to use it. There are restrooms right down that hallway there. Feel free to jump up anytime you need to run down that hallway. We will be taking regular breaks. We'll take about uh, a 10 minute break in about an hour. Um, and then we'll have a, about a 15 minute break. There is a, uh, a break between the safety portion and the legal portion. And that's what we cover in this class. This is not a gunfighting class. You will not be prepared to go out and get in a gunfight after this class. In fact, if you do, you'll probably lose. Uh, I, I find what the state requires uh, to be the absolute bare minimum that you should have to carry a gun. Um, I, th I think it's very inadequate. Uh, I do recommend that you go from here and get further training, but this is the bare minimum that the state requires and I still add to it. Uh, we're one of five instructors out of the 5,000 that have been licensed by the state of Utah that have actually submitted our curriculum to the uh, Utah board and had it approved. So this is beyond what the state requires, okay? So we're gonna cover firearm safety, we're gonna cover uh, the law regarding use of force and carrying of a firearm. Maybe, maybe this doesn't want to work. It worked before. This is a new computer. I, I apologize. It's being stupid. Yeah, no. Yeah, it worked when we walked down here. <coughs> there we go. Okay, there are two primary causes of firearm-related accidents. We have ignorance and we have carelessness. So ignorance, obviously, is not knowing any better. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna call you out, I hate to do it, but when you walked in and I checked your firearm, you held it in such a way that you were actually pointing it at yourself. And so you, you didn't know any better. So there was ignorance. Ignorance, most people are ignorant about something. Everybody has something that they're ignorant about. Quantum physics, nothing. I got nothing. I'm totally ignorant about it. Carelessness is knowing better and doing it anyway. Okay? So when you're careless, you know you're not supposed to do this, but you go ahead and you do it anyway. So we're going to try to minimize ignorance and carelessness by learning more and becoming more aware. The three elements of firearm safety are having a positive attitude, having the knowledge, and having the skill. How many of you drove a car here today? Okay. You drive a car every day, you don't think about it. It's no big deal to you. About a hundred times the number of people are killed in car accidents as are killed by firearms accidents. A, a car is a hundred times more dangerous than a firearm is. Yet you jump in one every day, you drive every day, so having the attitude that you can learn to safely handle a firearm and be safe with a firearm and use a firearm on a regular basis and become comfortable with that, it's just having the right positive attitude that you can do that. And then you build on that and you add in the knowledge. You add in the knowledge of how to operate the firearm and the more knowledge you have about that firearm, the more comfortable you're gonna become in using that firearm safely. And then as you take that positive attitude as you take that knowledge and you practice with it, you get more experienced with it, you'll develop the skill to safely use that firearm. There are four basic gun safety rules. First is you're always going to treat every firearm as if it's loaded. I've got a whole table full of guns over here. This is about 20% of my handgun collection right here. Okay, I am kind of a junkie. Um, all of these guns I've checked, they're all unloaded. These over here are dummy rounds. I've loaded them myself. They have no primer, they have no powder. They're absolutely inert and capable of firing. We have no live ammunition in this classroom. We 
have checked every one of these. The action is open on every one of these. And still, I'm never going to point one of those guns at you. Even though I verified, I've instilled in my mind that every gun is a loaded gun. And I'm always going to treat that gun as if it was a loaded gun. And by doing that and getting that brain set, you're not going to have an accident. You always treat that gun as if it's loaded. The second is you always keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target and you're ready to fire. So here I have a dummy gun. It's a plastic gun. It has no moving parts. It's incapable of accepting a round or magazine or doing anything. And still I'm not going to point this at you because I'm just going to get into that mindset that all guns are loaded guns. So to demonstrate, my finger is going to index right up here on the frame. When I'm not ready to shoot, this is where my finger goes. In between each shot, this is where my finger is going to go. So as I get lined up and ready to shoot, I'm going to bring the gun up. I'm going to press out. I'm going to get my alight, alignment on my sights. Then I'm going to transition my finger to the trigger. And when I'm done shooting, that finger comes back up to the side. I want it right here on the frame. Okay. This way, that finger's never on the trigger. We used to have accidents at the NRA and at the FBI Academy and at Fletzy. Every so often, somebody would have an accident and they would say, I don't know what happened. The gun just went off. And we had video surveillance and we would pull the video surveillance. And in every instance, they had pulled the trigger. They had put their finger on the trigger and pressed that trigger. It may not have been intentional, but they had actually activated the trigger on the gun, which makes the gun go bang. So the gun didn't just go off. Guns, if you set them there on the table, they're not going to just go off, okay? You have to actuate that trigger. Third one is never point a firearm at anything you are not willing to destroy. All guns are loaded at all times. Don't point a gun at something that you do not want to destroy. Always be aware of where the muzzle of that gun is. The muzzle is the part of the gun where the bullet comes out. It's the bad end. Always know where that's pointing. Never point it at yourself, at your cat, at your spouse, at your children. Never point it there. Always be aware of where that is. As you're moving around, there's a safe direction. It's down. And make sure it's not where your feet are. You're not shooting yourself in the feet. Always know where that muzzle is. Okay, keep it in a, in a safe direction. If you're at a range, the only safe direction is down range. So let's say the target's down there. That would be the only safe direction that you can point a gun at a range. So if you open up your gun case and it's pointed this way, do you pick it up and turn it around? No, you don't handle the gun when it's pointed in a safe direction. You turn the whole case around so that it's pointed down range before you handle that firearm. And before you make the decision to fire, you need to be sure your target your target's environment, and any other safety hazards. So what's beyond your target? A target's made out of paper in most cases. Sometimes you use steel, but for the most part, it's a piece of cardboard or a piece of paper, and you set it down range. When you shoot that bullet, that, that target, does that bullet just stop at the target? No, it keeps going, right? So if there's something beyond that target, it's going to get hit. It's going to keep going. Now, this becomes very important in a self-defense shooting situation. Just because the bad guy's right there, what's beyond the bad guy? Is there a schoolyard full of children beyond that bad guy? Should you shoot? That guy's a threat to your life. Shouldn't you shoot him? Well, if you miss or that bullet goes through him, it's going into that schoolyard full of children. And so now you've gone from a hero and a self-defender to a criminal that quick. So you need to be, you need to be knowledgeable of your target and what is beyond the target. And then any other safety hazards? Should you shoot under high tension power lines? Bullets ricochet, and they hit that high tension power line, and that thing comes down at you. First of all, it weighs about 2,500 pounds, and it's going to land on you, and it has a whole bunch of electricity going through it, and that electricity can travel through the ground into you. So do you shoot under high tension power lines? No, that's in any other safety hazards. Do you shoot at water, at a lake, at a stream? No, bullets bounce off of water. They zip. So you don't shoot at that. You shoot at rocks and concrete walls, and bullets can ricochet off of those. So it's not just, is there anything that you're going to hit down there that you can cause injury to? 
but can it actually cause injury to you? There's a great video of a guy, he's out shooting a 50 BMG sniper rifle and he hits a rock down range and that bullet turns around and comes back and takes his ear protection off his head. All right, so you need to know what you're shooting at down range. Some other safety rules, and some of these are specific to a range environment. You need to know your target and what is beyond the target. You need to know how to use that firearm safely. Be familiar with the operation of that firearm. Have basic understanding of safety rules and the basic understanding of that particular firearm. Be sure that the firearm itself is safe to operate. So we do something called a safety check on a firearm. So I'm going to remove the magazine. I'm going to show you how to do that later. Okay, I'm going to operate the slide. And I'm going to point it in a safe direction, pull the trigger. This particular gun will not fire without the magazine inside of it. So we got to put the magazine back in, pull the trigger, clicks, everything is safe to operate. Okay, it's not hanging up. It's not going to jam up on you. We've checked that gun out and it's safe to operate. Nothing's falling off of it. There aren't parts coming off of it. You want to make sure you're only using the correct ammunition for your firearm. We're going to spend time talking about how to identify the proper ammunition, how to identify what type of ammunition you're using, and how to uh, identify what type of ammunition that the firearm requires. We're going to also talk about some confusing factors about ammunition. There are certain ammunitions that are called multiple things. There are certain ammunitions that have more than one name. There are certain guns that take a specific type of ammunition and so help you identify what they are. If you're at a range and in a range environment, you're gonna make sure you're wearing hearing and eye protection at all times. Even when you're outside shooting 22s. I, I see this all the time. You've got kids with developmental hearing going on. Their, their hearing is in the development stage and their parents are out there shooting 22s with them and they say, well, they're not that loud, so it's okay. It's not the loudness, it's the resonant frequency. You're actually causing permanent hearing loss every time you pull the trigger because their hearing is in the development stage and the resonant frequency is so high, it's causing permanent hearing loss every time you shoot. So even with 22s, make sure you're wearing eye and ear protection. You can't grow your hearing back, you can't grow your eyes back. And you can lose those. Guns blow apart. Sometimes they have malfunctions. Sometimes ammunition has malfunctions. Pieces of the gun come off. Sometimes you hit a rock and it will ricochet and chunks of that, that metal and, and steel and lead and whatever rock can come back at you and you can lose your eyes. So make sure you have good eye protection and ear protection. Never use alcohol or drugs before or while you're shooting. Driving and, and drinking and drugs don't mix. Firearms, drinking and drugs don't mix. Put the guns away. Open up a, a cold one after you're done shooting, when the guns are all put away and you're not handling them anymore. But don't mix those together. You need to store your firearms so they're not accessible to unauthorized persons, i.e. children or restricted persons. Restricted persons are people who are legally not permitted to have possession of a firearm because they've been adjudicated mentally incompetent or they have a criminal record that precludes them from possession of a firearm. And then children. You don't want your kids to get access to your guns, and we're going to spend a significant portion of our time in the safety talking about that. And then never handle a, a handgun or a rifle or a shotgun in an emotional state such as depression, anger, anxiety. That's not the time to get out the gun and start cleaning them, okay? Put them away. Go for a walk. Call your pastor. Call your bishop. Call somebody you can talk to. Don't pull the guns out and start playing with them. Put them away. That's not the time. And then keep your firearm unloaded until it's ready for use. What do we mean by use? Anybody? Does it mean I'm going to shoot it? I carry a gun every day. It's loaded. Okay? My putting it on and having it available to be able to use to defend myself or another person who has the legal right to be defended is use. I take it off, goes to get put away in the safe, it gets unloaded. I don't store guns that are loaded. Okay. Now I have guns in my house that are loaded. I'm single. I don't have any children and the cats haven't figured out how to pull back a hammer yet. So I have loaded guns around the house where they are immediately available for my use. They are in use at that point, but when they're stored in the safe and they're being transported, they're unloaded. You want to be a knowledgeable gun handler and user, and that is beyond just taking this class. 
You want to know as much as you possibly can about your firearm and have general firearms knowledge. So understanding caliber choice and selection and what the different bullets and, and cartridges are. Uh, becoming more knowledgeable about firearms. If you're gonna carry a firearm on a daily basis, you wanna have as much general knowledge about firearms as you possibly can. Before you start to clean a gun, you want to be certain that that gun is unloaded. You're gonna physically verify, okay? I put this gun back in the bag and I take it home and I put it in the safe and I go about my daily day to business and then in a month I say, oh, that one probably needs cleaning. I know I put it away and it wasn't loaded, but I'm still gonna check. I make mistakes. You make mistakes, check it. It doesn't take you but a second to check that gun. Is this gun loaded? How do I know it's loaded? I drop the magazine, I pull back the slide, I verify visually that there is no round in that chamber. I point it in a safe direction and I pull the trigger. I lock the slide open, I know that gun's not loaded. Okay, and we're gonna go through that in detail. I'm gonna have you come and do this. When you clean the gun, it also provides you an opportunity to check the proper function of the gun. So after I get done cleaning the gun and I put it back together, I'm going to cycle the slide, point it in a safe direction, pull the trigger, lock the slide open. Seems like everything's functioning properly. I'm going to verify that again. When I'm out shooting, I'm always going to make sure that my gun barrel is free of obstruction. Anybody ever remember the old Bugs Bunny cartoons? He goes up there and he, yep, sticks his finger in the barrel of the gun. Do you know that is the only thing in popular media, movies, cartoons, that is accurate about guns? The only thing is if you put something in the barrel of that gun and pull the trigger, it will explode on you. And it sure does, too. Man. Put a carrot in there, it'll explode on you. Put your finger in there, it'll explode on you. When you hand a pistol to another person, you always wanna make sure that the muzzle is pointed in a safe direction, your finger is off the trigger, the action is open, the magazine has been removed and all the chambers are empty. What does that look like? So I have a firearm here. It's uh, identical to this one. It's the same gun, okay? So we're gonna demonstrate what it would look like if I'm handing the gun to you but I'm gonna do it with a live gun. So I'm gonna first take it out, I'm gonna drop the magazine. I'm gonna remove the magazine, which is the ammunition feeding device. I'm gonna lock the slide open. All of this while keeping it pointed in a safe direction. Notice it's not pointing at any of you. It's not pointing at me, it's not pointing at my feet. It's pointing over here on the other side of that wall. I happen to know that there's about 75 feet of dirt until you get to the other side of the street, okay? So it's pointed in a direction where if it were to discharge, Nobody's gonna get hurt. I'm not pointing it all around the room, pointing it at myself, okay? It's pointing at that wall in a safe direction. When I hand it to somebody, my fingers are gonna wrap around that trigger guard on the outside, not inside the trigger, on the outside. It's gonna be pointed down. And then George, I'm gonna hand it to you and he's gonna take it and I'm gonna say, do you have it? George, do you have it? No. You don't have it? No. If I, if I let safe. go, you'll drop it? Well, I, no, but it's not safe. <laughs> you have control of it? I do. Okay. I want to make sure he's got control of that firearm before I let go. Because if I don't, it could drop. And then it could go off. And somebody could get hurt. All right? So when I hand it, I'm going to say, do you have it? Say, so you have it. have it. Okay. Now he's got control of the trigger guard. His hands are over it. So if I try to grab it, my finger's not going to go in there and hit that trigger. Okay? So I have it. That gun is pointing in a safe direction at all times. We had an NRA board member, former member of Congress, and now he's a lawyer for the ACLU. His name's Bob Barr. He was a member of the board of uh, the NRA. He went to a party. Somebody pulled out a 1911. Gun looks like this. Said, hey, look at my new gun. Handed it to him. Boom, went through a sliding glass door. This is a member of the board member of the NRA, okay? Take a second, unload the gun before you hand it to somebody. Be safe about it. <clears throat> well, I think I went the wrong way. Okay. Um, you wanna make sure you're only carrying one type of ammunition and it's the type of ammunition that goes in that gun. Especially when you get into certain rifles. There are cartridges there are, that will chamber in the wrong gun and will fire in the wrong gun, and it can have catastrophic results if it does that. 
Uh, there are certain ammunitions that will fit into guns and fire in those guns that don't belong in those guns. So if you carry multiple ammunition around, if I carry around some 9mm and some 40 cal, this is one that I've actually seen. Uh, we were at a IDPA match. It's a comp uh, competition, competitive shooting competition at the NRA headquarters range. And one of the range officers was carrying a 9mm Glock. And one of the competitors was shooting a 40 caliber Glock and he was having some feet issues with the gun. So he handed it to the range officer and the range officer didn't verify. He thought he knew what that gun was. And he took one of his nine millimeter magazines and he threw it into that 40 caliber gun and he fired around down range and it went like this in the barrel and it messed up his gun pretty bad. So, don't carry around multiple ammunitions of multiple caliber of guns. Carry around the ones you need for your gun. Here's a favorite one. and This show's not on the air anymore, but it was a lot of fun to watch when it was. It was called Pawn Stars. You guys ever watch Pawn Stars? And inevitably, somebody would bring in, every couple months, somebody would bring in Grandpa's old musket that hung over the mantel place. And they'd say, what's what, the value on this? What would you give me for this? And they'd say, well, is it loaded? No, it's not loaded. It's been sitting on the mantel for 150 years. Well, Grandpa lived in Indian territory and he had bears in his backyard. And I guarantee you, if he had a muzzle loader over the fireplace, it was loaded. And if you've never checked that gun, it's probably loaded. And inevitably, they would take it out there and they would find out, yeah, this gun is loaded. So I'm going to show you some tricks to verify whether that gun is loaded or not. Real easy way without looking down the barrel of that old muzzle loader to figure out if that gun's loaded or not. And uh, we'll show you some of those too. But check it. That old, you know, lever action Henry that grandpa had over the mantle, he had Indians, he had bears, he had lions. So I guarantee that gun was loaded when it was over the mantle. Uh, make sure you don't fire at surfaces that can cause a bullet to ricochet, such as water, hard, flat objects. At the FBI Academy, we used to do a demonstration where we'd set a balloon on the other side of a car, and we would actually get on this side of the car about 25 yards back, and we would shoot at the ground, and it would skip off and hit that balloon, because what it does is it hits, and then it parallels the ground. You would think it would hit and then come back up at an obtuse angle, but it doesn't. It comes up, it parallels the ground. You can actually do that off a brick wall, too. It'll parallel the wall. So don't shoot at hard, flat surfaces, unless you got a bad guy on the other side of the car shooting at you, then take his ankles out. But if you have a cartridge that fails to fire when the trigger is pulled, you're going to keep that muzzle pointed in a safe direction. Do not try to take and unload the gun at that point. There's a condition, and we're going to talk about it in more detail, where the primer, which these rounds don't have primers, but they have a little hole in the back where the primer would be if these were live rounds, the primer strikes and burns slow. And then eventually it will cook off that powder that's inside there. This is called a hang fire. So it goes click or it goes pop, boom. So let's say it goes boom while you're in the middle of opening up the action and now you have hot exploding gas coming out in your face from the action of this gun. So you wait 30 seconds, you pull the trigger, pop, click, no bang. You wait 30 seconds, finger off the trigger, gun pointed in a safe direction. After 30 seconds, now you can open it up. You know it's not going to blow up in your face. Gives it an opportunity to go through its process. If you're shooting and you hear something like a pop instead of a bang, don't shoot another round. There's a condition called a squib load. And what may have occurred is the bullet, which is the projectile part of the cartridge, this little bra uh, bra uh, copper piece right here on top of the brass, may have exited the case and lodged in the barrel. What happens if you fire a gun with an obstructed barrel? Elmer Fudd, boom, right? So what you want to do is after you're done shooting and it goes pop, you want to make sure there's no round stuck in that barrel. And shooting another round will blow that gun up in your face. Well, you're not going to look down the barrel of the gun, right? That's not how you do it. So you can take that gun apart. We're going to show you how to do that. Take the barrel off. Look down the barrel from the way that the bullet travels. Make sure there's nothing stuck in that barrel. Or you can take a pen. I have some pens back here. You can take a pen or a cleaning rod or a stick 
and you can shove it down the barrel. I can see it. That barrel's not obstructed. Or, in the case of a gun that is like something you can't open up, like this puppy here, I can measure how far down that goes. Right about there. I can put it down there and say, okay, that's not obstructed. I know that's going all the way down, okay? You can do that with a muzzle loader as well if you have a cleaning rod. You can lay it alongside all the way down to the breech, put your fingers there, shove it down the barrel. If it stops about that short, that's the bullet and powder and wadding and that's a loaded gun, okay? So if that happens, stop firing immediately, keep that muzzle pointed in a safe direction, keep your finger off the trigger, unload the gun, make sure that the chamber is empty, visually inspect the barrel for obstructions. As a permit holder, you are responsible for teaching children and other occupants in your home about firearm safety. If you have guns in your home, make sure everybody in the, in the home knows how to check that gun to see if it's loaded or unloaded. There was a case in Georgia when I was living there. This woman got into a fight with her, her ex-husband, her husband, I guess, they were married. And they were breaking up and she decided she was gonna show him and sell all his guns. So he had a bunch of guns, laying, rifles, laying in the closet. She went in there and she grabbed an arm load like this, picked them up, walked them out, banged the coffee table, blew a bullet right through here and out the back of her head because nobody had ever showed her how to safely handle a firearm. If there's guns in the house and other people can come into contact with them, make sure they know how to at least verify that that gun is loaded or unloaded and know how to load it or unload it or cock it. I got a call at the NRA range one day when I was working there. This lady called down to the range and she goes, I don't know anything about guns, but my husband has this revolver and I accidentally pulled back the hammer thingy. I don't know what to do. I can't open that cylinder thingy. Well, the thing is with a revolver, when the cylinder, when the hammers pull back, the cylinder doesn't open. You can't open the cylinder. And unless you know how to decock that gun safely, it's now what I told her as a hand grenade with a mouse trap attached to it. Because this is the trigger pull on when the hammer's down. That's the trigger pull when the hammer's back. It's double action versus single action. That's single action right there. Real light, easy touch. So I said, open up the trunk of your car, keep your finger away from the trigger, put this pointing towards the engine compartment in the trunk of your car, close the trunk, and I'll be there as soon as my shift is over. Where's your address? And I drove over there, I decocked the gun for her. It was loaded, by the way. She didn't know. Decocked the gun for her, opened it up, unloaded the gun. I said, do you have a padlock? Yeah. Do you have the key? No. Is it open? Yeah. Put a padlock right through there. So when your husband comes home, make sure he shows you how to unlo unlock that gun and unload it and load it and safely handle it. There's no way she should have had access to a firearm that was loaded, that she could play with without having any idea how to check and make sure it was safe. That was an irresponsible gun owner, her husband, okay? If you're gonna live in a house with guns, it's your responsibility as a concealed carry permit holder, as a gun owner, to make sure anybody who has access to that gun and can come into contact with that gun knows how to safely handle it. If a child comes into contact with guns, they need to know the difference between the real thing and what they see on television, cartoons, and toy guns. I don't like toy guns. I don't like kids having toy guns. I hate them. I've taken away more realistic guns from kids and broken them right in front of them because I don't want them to get the idea in their head that it's okay just because it's a toy. I can point it at people, right? Because we didn't have a 12-year-old kid in Illinois get shot by cops because he pointed a toy gun at them, right? That never happens. Toy guns are stupid. If you're gonna give your kids guns, get them some airsoft guns and make them treat them like real guns. 
I've had conversations with kids who had BB guns. I was shooting at cats and shooting at houses and shooting at light poles and shooting. That's a real gun. The law treats that like a real gun, by the way. You point a BB gun at a cop, you're going to get shot. The law treats that just like a firearm. Okay? Airsoft guns. You shoot the neighbor kid with an airsoft gun, it's assault with a deadly weapon. The law treats that like a firearm in Utah. So teach them the difference. It's not like the TV. You shoot somebody one time, they're not going down. Bad guy's coming at you, and you shoot him one time, odds are he's not going to go down and stop being a threat. And he won't be back on next week's episode all healed. And neither will you. Make sure they know the difference. And if the child does come in touch, in, in contact with a gun, a real gun, they need to know what to do. The NRA has a program called the Eddie Eagle Program. It's a great program. It's the only program in the world that's endorsed by both the National Rifle Association and the National Education Association. It's the only time they ever come together on the same page. And it does not use firearms. It teaches children, if they come in contact with the firearm, that they are to stop. Don't touch. Leave the area. Tell a responsible adult. There's even a song. Anybody know the song? You know the song? I do. You want to sing it? Stop. Don't touch. Leave the area. Tell an adult. There's a song. Yeah, that, that was a, an adult when I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> every, every class, there's always somebody who's heard it and, and can sing the song. It's awesome. So they use cartoons, and they use an, a guy in an eagle suit, and they use comic books, and they, they really tie into the kids, and they know what to do to stop. Don't touch. Leave the area. Tell a responsible adult. And it, it sinks it into their heads. And as they grow up and go on in life, many of them become responsible gun owners. So we're going to talk about the handgun parts and operation of both an, a revolver and a semi-automatic. Now, you guys know the difference between a revolver and a semi-automatic, correct? Who doesn't? It's okay. Okay, good. Thank you, Annie. This is a revolver. It operates by means of a cylinder that consists of, in this case, six chambers that revolve to place the round in the firing position. Every time I pull that hammer back, the cylinder revolves, thus the name revolver. Okay? There are two types of revolvers. There are single action and double action revolvers. This particular gun is a double action revolver. It will operate in both double and single action. Verify that it's unloaded. When I pull this hammer back, pulling the trigger causes one action to occur, the hammer to fall forward. The hammer is now placed under spring tension. Pulling the trigger, one action occurs, the hammer falls forward. Double action mode, two actions occur. Pulling the trigger causes the hammer to go back and fall forward, two actions. Single action, the hammer is placed under spring tension. Pulling the trigger causes one action, the hammer to fall. Double action, two actions occur. Hammer goes back, falls forward, and fires. A semi-automatic uses a ammunition feeding device called a magazine. What is this? Magazine. Everybody, what is this? Magazine. What is this not? Clip. This is not a clip. This is not a clipazine. This is not a nuclear-powered baby killer, which you would hear in the media. You know, this is a box with a spring that pushes cartridges into a gun. This particular one is 15 rounds. This is a standard feeding device for this gun right here. Okay, this is a semi automatic. The cartridges are fed from the magazine into the action of the gun, they go right in here. As that goes in, is this gun now loaded? Let's make it even more interesting. Is this gun now loaded? No. In fact, it's not loaded statutorily under the law, and it is not loaded practically. If I pull this trigger, nothing happens. 
I have to take a round from that magazine and insert it into the chamber. And I do that by pulling the slide back and letting the slide go. Okay? Now, this gun is loaded, statutorily and practically. When I say statutorily, Utah law says that a round in the firing position and more than one mechanical action, or, or one mechanical action will cause the gun to fire. Both of those elements must be present for the gun to be loaded. Round in the firing position and one mechanical action. If it takes more than one mechanical action and there is no round in the firing position, that gun is statutorily unloaded and can be carried openly without a concealed carry permit. And we'll get into that in the legal portion. But this gun is loaded. It would be illegal for me to carry this open without a permit. So, remove the magazine. I put three in there, right? Where's the other one? It's in the gun. So if I pull this trigger right now, and this was a live round, would the gun go bang? So this gun's loaded, right? So I have to unload it. There it is. It's in the chamber. So why is it called a semi-automatic? Because it automatically puts the bullets in, but you have to make that happen. Like yes and no. So I have to put the bullet in manually. I have to put a round in the chamber manually. Now, when I pull the trigger, the gun will cycle. The recoil will cause the slide to come back, eject the spent shell casing, and automatically take a round from the magazine and insert it into the chamber. And now if I pull the gun again, it'll do the same thing. Until the gun runs empty, it will fire one shot, automatically load it, that round in for every time I pull the trigger. So what is the difference between a semi-automatic and a fully automatic? No. With a fully automatic, so with a semi-automatic, I'm getting one shot per pull of the trigger. With a fully automatic, if I hold the trigger down, it will keep firing until either I stop or the magazine runs empty. That is full auto. So you hear all this talk in the media about assault weapons. An assault weapon, by definition, is a multi-shot per pull of the trigger. So if it's a three-round burst or select fire, Select fire allows you to choose single semi-automatic mode or three-round burst or full auto. You can select the mode that you want it to fire in. A, a assault rifle or assault weapon is multi-firing when you pull the trigger. More than one round comes out. So an AR-15 that any of you can go by is not an assault weapon by the definition of what an assault weapon is. It is not. So a semi-automatic, pull the trigger, it throws the round out, it loads another one, throws the round out, loads another one, but one round is fired per pull of the trigger. Semi-automatic. I'm going to be spitting bullets at you all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now that I know you are, I won't shout. <laughs> the first one was like, what? All right, so now that we've clarified what are the difference between a revolver and a semi-automatic, we're going to talk about the frame of the gun. The frame is the skeleton. Everything on the gun is attached to the frame. It's the backbone to which all of the parts are attached. And that includes the grip panels. And a good example of that is our... Where's my... Oh, I've got it in the holster still. Here's my special 1911 here. The grip panels, in this case, are black flame in a laser grip, okay? That's attached to the frame. You have the back strap, which is the rear vertical portion of the gun. And that can be exposed, as it is on this revolver, or it can be underneath a wraparound grip, as it is on this revolver. Or it can be not apparent at all, as it is on this semi-automatic, but it's still there. It's just under that grip. In this particular gun, this Glock 17, you can actually pop that pin out, take that one off, and put a different size one on. And the same with this M&P from Smith & Wesson. This particular back strap is a laser. When I grab the gun, that laser comes on by having the proper grip. 
and it can be taken off and different sizes can be put on. The trigger guard is the external frame that blocks the trigger from catching on things inadvertently. I don't like guns without trigger guards. They make a few. I don't like them. It's very easy to be putting the gun someplace and hit that trigger guard and boom, it goes off. Plus, I don't know where to put my finger. I don't want my finger on the trigger unless I'm ready to shoot, right? So that trigger guard keeps that from happening. The front and rear sights, they are used for aiming. These white dots right here, that white dot right there, I line those up and those are used for aiming and those are considered part of the frame. On a revolver, they're considered part of the frame, especially the rear sight. The front sight's on the barrel, but it's still considered part of the frame. The barrel is a metal tube through which a bullet passes on its way to the target and is composed of different parts. It's composed of the bore, which is the inside of the barrel, inside of that metal tube. The riflings, which are a combination of lands and grooves, which add flight, stability, accuracy, and distance to a bullet. Anybody ever see a football player throw a ball? How do they get the most distance out of it? You spiral to it, right? It spins. If you throw a ball and it tumbles, it doesn't go nearly as far or as straight is one that spins. Same principle as a bullet. That spinning bullet causes it to have greater accuracy and distance. There are ridges that are called rifling, the lands, and then there is the grooves. There are valleys and peaks. I'm gonna show you a picture here in a second. They cause the, those exploding gases to spin in a vortex as they go down that barrel. That spinning transfers to the projectile being pushed through the barrel causes it to come out spinning and you have a greater accuracy and greater distance. The caliber of a gun is the distance between the lands inside that bore. I'm going to show you a diagram because everybody's going, huh? Here is a very simplified, most of them have six, a very simplified diameter of the inside of a barrel. The diameter right here between this land and this land is the caliber. And that can be measured in inches, it can be measured in millimeters. So a 9 mm, a 9 millimeter, is 9 millimeters between that land and that land inside the barrel. A 40 caliber is 0 0.40 inches between that right there. It also happens to be 10 millimeters. You can swap those around. And why is that important? Because what did I do with it? This right here is a 40 caliber handgun. Oh no, it was loaded. See, I should have checked. This is a 40, a 40 caliber handgun, 0 0.40. Well, why do I make such a big deal out of that? Because it's also a 10 millimeter Kurtz in Germany. Kurtz means short. This is a 10 millimeter handgun. This doesn't shoot the same rounds as this, even though they're the same diameter. This one shoots a longer version of this. That's why I make the distinction. And we're going to talk about some of the ammunitions that are similar or different or the same and have different names. But in this case, we're looking at 0 0.40 or 10 millimeters between that and that. That is the caliber of the gun. Doesn't mean that that's the cartridge that it shoots, but that's the caliber. What about 22? 22. Mm -hmm. So it would be 0 0.22 inches. Or, or point, it's two, two, two tenths of an inch. So in a revolver, the action is the group of moving parts used to load, fire, unload the pistol. And in a revolver, you have the trigger. When the trigger is pulled, it activates the hammer, which in turn causes the firing pin to strike and fire the cartridge. And that firing pin may be internal or external. So in this Model 66 Smith & Wesson, if you look right here, that little piece right there is the firing pin. See that little point? That's the firing pin. It is exposed on this particular model. Right there, see that? Right there, see that? That is the firing pin. On this particular model, 
it is exposed. Okay? But that is not always the case. Sometimes it's internal. This one, there's no firing pin. There's actually one inside there. And in this particular model, there's a little pan right there. You see that little metal piece right there? A little flat metal piece? That is a safety feature on this revolver. So unless I pull the trigger to pull that little metal piece out, see that little right there, that little flat shelf? See that little flat shelf right there? Unless I pull the trigger to move that shelf out of the way, if I drop this on the hammer and it falls, it's not gonna go bang. It's a safety feature that's in place to block the firing pin, which is internal to the frame, to keep that gun from going off unless the trigger is pulled to pull that shelf out of the way. The cylinder holds the cartridges in individual chambers. The cylinder on this gun is this piece right here that rolls out and revolves. Each one of those holes is called a chamber. Holds the round in firing position. Each time the hammer moves to the rear, the cylinder turns or revolves and brings a new chamber in line with the barrel and the firing pin. The cylinder release latch releases the cylinder and allows it to swing out so the cartridges can be loaded and unloaded. And there may be multiple kinds, again. So on this Model 66, you push this lever forward. It allows the cylinder to swing out. That is a cylinder release latch. On this Ruger GP100, it's a button. You push the button straight down and it allows it to come out. So you need to know on your gun, is it a button or is it a, put, a, a lever you push forward, push toward the end of the barrel. This Rossi is modeled on a J-framed Smith & Wesson. You push it forward. Colts, same way, you push it forward. Charter arms can be one of the either two. Rugers, most of them are a button. Okay. So knowing your type of firearm and the type that it has, if you pick it up and you don't know what brand it is, if you don't know what type it is, try pushing it forward. If that doesn't work, push it down. Single action, the trigger performs only one action. It releases the hammer to fall. So it means that hammer is under spring tension and is already ready to go. An example of this would be the old Colt 45, the old cowboy guns, Ruger Vaqueros, Ruger single sixes, the old single action cowboy gun revolvers, and they usually feed via a gate. I should get one because I don't have one. There's usually a little gate right here that opens up. You pull the hammer back a half stop and it lets you turn the cylinder and you load each one one at a time. The cylinder doesn't pop out. And you have to, have to, have to pull the hammer back to make it fire. If the hammer's forward and you pull the trigger, nothing will happen. That's a single action only. This is a single double. Single action and double action. It will pull hammer back, pull the trigger, or you can pull the trigger in double action mode. Okay? Why would you never want to have a, a Historical action? purposes mainly. Uh, the old cowboy actions were only single action. In fact, Richard back there has one of the very first Colts that was double A and single action. We didn't know it was single action. It has the gate on it. It has the half cock so that you can turn the cylinder. Didn't realize until one day I pulled the trigger to show somebody the difference that it was double and single action. It was one of the very first Colts that did that. What I don't understand is why you would, why do they make new guns now that have the single double? Why, why not so just the double? So with just the double, and, and some of the revolvers that are out there are just double action. They either have the hammer shaved off or they have it enclosed where you can't even access it. So the difference is a long, and you're gonna come up here and you're gonna pull triggers. You're gonna load guns and you're gonna unload guns. We're gonna have you do that. And so when you pull the trigger on this, you'll see it's a long, hard, intentional trigger squeeze. You have to be very controlled to keep that gun steady and work it through that entire cycle without coming off target. So if I'm on target, I have to intentionally go through that entire long cycle. I'm not gonna accidentally flinch and pull that trigger, okay? But 
If I have a very light trigger squeeze, just barely touch that trigger. Here it's about eight to 12 pounds. Here it's about two pounds to pull that trigger. The difference is don't move. I said don't move. Now I'm serious, right? Now it just barely touched that trigger and it's gonna go. This is, what, what's that sound? What's that? <laughs> trigger didn't go off, did it? And a lot of the guns that are coming out now have what they call a self-defense trigger. The triggers are long and hard. The gun I carry most days now is the Smith & Wesson Shield, okay? You have to mean to pull that trigger. You're not gonna flinch and pull that trigger. You have to mean it. It's about six to seven pounds. It's a self-defense trigger. The gun I carried for years is my special baby has a match trigger in it, about one and three quarter pounds. You barely touch that trigger and it goes off. Just barely touch it. If I take the safety off, just barely touch it and it goes off. It's considered a match trigger. It's a very light trigger. It's not what you want to be scoping through the house when you hear a noise in the middle of the night and Mark walks out of the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Okay. You have to pick the type of trigger you want. The revolver, with double and single action, it gives you that option. It gives you the option of going for a very precise, easy trigger pull, or I mean to pull this trigger, but I don't want to pull it by accident. So that's why you would have both. Is that what you call a hair trigger? Uh, a hair trigger is beyond a match trigger. I, when I built this gun, where is it? I built this gun. When I built this gun, the only thing that's original to the gun is it was a cheap $250 Citadel is the frame. Everything else, all the internals of this gun have been replaced. And the trigger came in bare. I had to grind it and hone it to get it where I want. So the first run at it, it was about one and a quarter pounds. And when you would fire the gun, the recoil would set the next round off. And all of a sudden you're bop, 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 bop. And you don't want to be. You want to be able to stop that. And you can't stop that. Letting off the trigger doesn't stop it. The recoil is bumping that trigger. So I took it out, rehoned it some more, got it down to about three and a half pounds. So what it was, was a hair trigger. I mean, you blow on it and it goes off. It's not safe. A hair trigger is, the implication of that is it's not safe. A match trigger is, it's really light. It's not what you're going to want to carry for a self-defense gun unless you have a lot of training and you can control that finger off that trigger versus, oops, I flinched and somebody's dead. So that self-defense trigger trend is out now. It's a much heavier, intentional, you meant to pull that trigger. You got to work at it. Okay, some of them are nine. Uh, I think I got rid of it. I did. I had the car. My mom still got one. It's a good gun, but you need to mean to pull that trigger for it to go off. You're gonna work through that trigger pull. Smith & Wesson came out with their SDV90. That thing's got like a 12 to 15 pound trigger pull. You're pulling on that trigger all day long and next week to get that thing to go off. Boom. You mean to pull that trigger, okay? In a semi-automatic, the actions are the slide. And upon initial loading, it takes a round from the magazine, feeds it into the chamber. Sliding that brings a round up and puts it in the chamber, okay? The magazine is a cartridge storage device, spring-loaded. What is this? Magazine. What is this not? Liquid. Correct. You guys know the difference? There is a difference. There are two separate different devices, okay? So a magazine is never a clip and a clip is never a magazine. Why is that important? Let's say I'm in a firefight and I got guys shooting at me and I run out of rounds and I need more. And I say, throw me a clip. What are you gonna get? You're gonna get a clip. What if you needed a magazine? Then why'd you ask for a clip? You ask for what you need, right? If I got a revolver, And that revolver takes something called a moon clip. And I need 
another clip for my revolver, and I say, throw me a magazine, what am I gonna get? If I shoot an M1 Garand, this type of rifle that was used in the military during World War II, it takes a clip. And you stuff that clip down in there, and when you're done shooting, boom, 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 bing, that clip goes flying out. Okay, and then the guy standing over there, shooting an M1 Garand, and I'm shooting an AR-15, uses a magazine, and I get done shooting, and I say, throw me a clip! He's gonna throw me what he's shooting, and it's not gonna fit, it isn't gonna work. So you ask for what you use, you ask for what you need. You use the proper terminology so that you don't get the wrong thing in a firefight. You so get it into your head. Clips there? I mean, you've got all magazines. These are all magazines. No clips. no clips. Nope. There's nothing here that shoots a clip. Uh, I don't even think... Yeah, this one's machined out. This one will accept a clip. So you see how it's recessed? Mm -hmm. If I have a clip that holds all six rounds, I can just throw that in there. Boom, close it and go. Hmm? Speed loader. Yep. Well, there, a speed loader would be different than a clip in this case. So a speed loader holds the rounds. I drop it in there, push the button, it falls away, or I take it off, and I close the gun and I shoot. In this case, it will take a, a moon clip that holds all six rounds. I drop it in there, and the clip stays attached, and I close the cylinder and shoot. That's way too much information for right now. But the point is, ask for what you need, be precise, and you'll get what you need. So the magazine is a storage device designed to hold the cartridges ready for insertion into the chamber of a semi-automatic firearm. The magazine release is a button or a device that releases the magazine so that it can be removed from the pistol. There are two types of these in common use, and actually we have three types here. Uh, you have the standard magazine release. In this case, it's this button right here. By pushing that button, it allows the magazine to drop free. Thus, it is called a drop-free magazine, okay? And you let them fall on the ground. Magazines are disposable. They are consumable devices. They are intended to be used up and replaced every so often. They are not a lifetime part of the gun. The more you practice, eventually you'll break them. They'll stop working. You wear them out. You buy new ones. They're fairly inexpensive. $700 gun. $40 magazine. Use them up. Practice enough. Use them up and they'll go. This particular one, did I not bring the magazine for this one either? Yeah, yes I did. Okay. This is a European style magazine release. It is not drop free. It was designed by the French because they didn't like to drop their magazines in the mud. The little French peoples. So you have to pull back on this lever the magazine will start to pop out, and then you have to manually pull it out. It does not drop free. Because they are the French. They don't like muddy magazines. They have never won the war either. And then we have the H and K Germans. Here are the H and K Germans. This is the way you drop a magazine. On the trigger guard, then it goes down with a gusto. Okay? That's how the Germans do it. That's the H and K Walthers are right there on the trigger guard. So if you're over here looking for that magazine release and you can't find it, look on the bottom, see if it's a French type, or look on the trigger guard and see if it's right there on the trigger guard. Right there, hard to see. It blends in, but there's no button on the side here. If you can't find that button, it might be there. One of the things I see people do a lot, especially with the Glocks and the M&Ps, what did I do with that Glock 17? I got too many guns to pick from. I guess it right there. So I'll see people, and they'll be pushing like crazy on that trigger, that magazine release. See it right there? They'll be pushing like crazy, and, and sometimes it works, and sometimes you squeeze, and when you squeeze, nothing happens. Nothing happens. Why? Because this actually can be taken out, reversed, and put on the other side. So on the other side, when you're pushing and you're squeezing, you're pushing on the other side of that, and nothing happens if you squeeze. So just push. Don't squeeze. 
Just push. Okay. And I see people at the range and they're going, I'm pushing this thing and it's stuck. It's not working because they're squeezing. Just push. The trigger is pulled, it activates the hammer or the internal firing mechanism. So a Glock, like I just had, is called a striker fired pistol. And Glock has taken it to the next step and, and proprietary, proprietarized it. And they call themselves a safe action pistol, but it's still a striker fired pistol. There's an internal hammer. So when this comes back, it pushes over that internal hammer that you can't see. Whereas a Sig Sauer, for example, actually has a hammer and you can see that hammer and you can actually disengage that hammer with a safe hammer disengagement device. So it may be internal, it may be external. This one has a hammer but you can barely see it. See it? Barely there. Okay. So when the trigger is pulled, it activates the hammer or the internal firing mechanism, which when released causes the firing pin to strike and fire the cartridge. The slide moves to the rear, ejecting the empty cartridge. Where's that M and P? Slide moves to the rear, and when it has fired, it ejects that empty, takes in a new one, if you got a new one in the magazine. If it's empty, most of the time it will lock open like that. As it moves forward, it takes the next cartridge that's in the magazine, pushes it into the chamber, ready to be fired again. And it also cocks the gun because it's pushing over that internal hammer or it's pushing back the external hammer. So a good example of that is this 1911. See it hammers back? A 1911, the hammer has to be back for it to fire. That was at a, I do weddings, I marry people. And I was at a wedding up in Penguich, and it was some guys I know, and they always want to know, where's your gun, what do you carry, and they're always shocked I'm carrying a gun. So I open carried my pretty 1911 for them when I did the wedding. And I'm walking around, and I've got the 1911 in the holster, and the hammer's back like that. And this guy comes up and goes, you know the hammer's back on your 1911? Yeah. Dumbass. That's how you carry a 1911. <laughs> he didn't know that. He goes, well, why, why do you have to have the hammer back to carry a 1911? Because if you don't, when I draw it and pull the trigger, nothing will happen. I don't carry an uncocked gun. I don't carry an unloaded gun. And we'll talk about why in a little while. But if you carry a 1911 with a hammer down, nothing's going to happen. It is a single action gun. It must have the hammer back in order to be functional. This gun won't fire unless the hammer's back. So, as a result of that, when the gun fires, the slide comes back, ejects the spent shell casing, and also pushes that hammer back, ready to be fired again. Cocks it for you so that it can fire again. Comes back, ready to fire again. The gun does that every time you fire. The force of the explosion inside the chamber pushes that gun back. So I don't have to do this, but once. I do this one time, it puts a round in the chamber, I pull the trigger and the gun does it all by itself. From that point on, every time I pull the trigger, it automatically cocks it. So I see people go to the range, because they see me doing this, the glass, and they go, so I fire the trigger, okay, now I gotta do this again. No, it, the gun does that for you, okay? It's hard to explain without the gun actually shooting, so when we go to the range, if you ever go to the range with me, you'll see it in action. It wouldn't allow you to cock it again if it had already cocked, right? It what do you mean? It means it automatically does that. You Correct, but to unload the gun, you need to cock it. So, unfortunately, I, I couldn't find my dummy rounds. I don't know where they went. I've lost them. So I made rounds last night, and I tried to paint these with nail polish, and I ran out of nail polish after the 45, thank goodness, because they don't feed. But we use a 40 cal. I use it for my sights. You can buy sight paint. It's like $12 a bottle. Or you can go down to the dollar store and buy nail polish. And it's better and it lasts longer and it's like a buck a bottle. So 
I have lots of nail polish and bright neon colors. I did get some on my nail. I got some, and it's good stuff. It wouldn't come off. It took me like forever to, to get it off. Um, well, well, that's the problem. So remember I said don't mix up your ammo? I just put 40 caliber rounds in a nine millimeter magazine. Because I have two guns that are identical. One's nine and one's 40. <laughs> so always check, carry the right ammo. So this one's a 40. So what I, when I say that, you said that they won't let you bring it back if it's, if it's already cocked. Well, you need to, because to unload the gun, you have to bring it back. Okay, and you lock it open and that round comes out. So to unload that gun safely, you need to be able to pull it back when it's loaded. So it won't lock you out. So we're going to demonstrate how to check both a revolver and the semi-automatic to ensure proper function of the firing mechanism and safety. So this is where I get you guys to come up here and you're gonna handle guns. So what I'm gonna have is you three are gonna come up here first. Our safe direction is gonna be this direction. It is the only direction that we will point a firearm because there's at least 75 feet of dirt on the other side of that wall. Okay, so you three come on up. And I'm gonna hand you a firearm and we're going to do a revolver first. So George, I'm gonna give you the big guy. You can be Dirty Harry. So come over here. Keep that pointed in a safe direction. I'm stepping on the cord. Annie, I'm gonna give you my favorite. And what is your name? Patty. Patty, I'm gonna give you the little guy. Okay, and I'm gonna give each of you three rounds of 357 Magnum. And it will become abundant to you and abundantly clear to you in a minute why I didn't give you six. Okay, so I'd like you to load three rounds into your revolver. Now I made it easy on you. I had the actions open for you already. So let's see. So when they are loaded, go ahead and close your cylinders. Okay, so if you pull that trigger and those were live rounds, would it go bang? Yes. How do you know? Because I offset it by one, because I know when I pull the trigger, it's going to bring that around one. Which way is that cylinder going to rotate? Clockwise. How do you know that? Well, I've owned many. I've never known one to go counterclockwise. All your Colts go counterclockwise. Some of your yeah. charter arms go counterclockwise. So here is the thing you can look at to know. On the gun, you'll see a little mushroom cap looking thing. And it will have a, a rectangle and then a little depression. The direction of that depression is the direction of rotation of your cylinder. Hmm. So none of these are Colts, so they all go counter clockwise. So mine won't fire because my rounds are over here and it's gonna... Correct, it's gonna rotate out of position. So that's why I only gave you three because I wanted you to have to think through the problem of how do I set it up. So go ahead and open your cylinders. Each one is going to open differently. Yours is going to push it down. Yours is going to slide forward. Yours is going to slide forward. You can leave them loaded, but I want you to close your cylinders so that they will rotate into position and fire if you were to pull the trigger. Yours will. Now yours will. I need more room over here. And now yours will. Good. You, you figured out the problem. So go ahead, point the gun, full arm extension. And I want you to fire in the double action position. Now? Mm-hmm. Good. Go ahead and open your cylinders. Put them in position so that they will fire when you pull the trigger. Okay, and Annie, I want you to fire just you in the single action position. Single action. Correct, single action. 
Excellent. You were paying attention. Fire. Yep. Okay. George, I want you to fire in the double action position. Correct. Patty, I want you to fire in the single action position. Good. I want you all to fire in the single action position. Good. I want you to open your revolvers and unload them. So there's a, a button right here, this lever. It's called an ejector, ejector rod. And when you push on it, it ejects the, rod, the rounds out. So here's a trick for you. Okay, go ahead and set your guns down. We're going to have you stay up here because we're going to do semi-automatics, but I'm going to show everybody a trick. So with a revolver, here's a trick. To unload it, once the rounds have been fired, they're fire formed in the chamber. They've actually expanded and are tight in the chamber. So if I take them while they're unfired and I push them up, they're likely going to just fall right out in my hand. But if they've been fired, they're going to be tight. They're going to stay in there. So here's a trick for you. When I open the cylinder up, I push the button, I reach around with my hand, I give it a reach around here, and I slide it open. Okay? I'm actually going to use that to hang the gun on. And then I'm going to take this hand, since they're fired, I'm going to take this hand, and I'm going to slam it down. And that's going to eject them. This is a fine motor skill. This is going to go away in a gunfight. I might miss. This is a gross motor skill. It drops those rounds. No missing. This, difficult. This, easy. In a firefight, you want easy. Okay? Pop my bracelet open. All right. So that's your trick with the revolver. Then, when I go to load it, I'm going to drop it straight down. I'm going to drop my rounds in. I'm going to grab it in the firing position, slam it closed, and I'm back in the fight. If I have a speed loader, I'm going to drop the speed loader in, let it fall to the ground, close it, back in the fight. Okay. Semi-automatics. Let's see. What are we going to give everybody? I'm going to give you this one. Hold that in that hand, and I'm going to trade you. George, what did you carry in the, in the sheriff's department? 38 revolver. Didn't carry a semi-auto at all? Okay. I'm going to give you the most common law enforcement gun that there is. Trade you that. You right-handed or left-handed? Right. Put that in your left hand. Most commonly carried firearm in law enforcement, the Glock 17 9mm. It's carried by the FBI. The only reason I own one is because I taught at the FBI Academy. I don't like them, but they're carried by a lot of law enforcement. Cheap as bitter. Okay, you still got your 357s? I'll take those. So, each of you have a semi-automatic handgun. Each of you have three rounds in a magazine. Each of you are holding the firearm in your shooting hand. You're always going to load holding it in your shooting hand, in the shooting position. Just as if you were going to shoot, you hold it that way when you load it. Okay? You're going to take your magazine in your non-shooting hand or your weak hand. You're going to rotate the gun and I like to put it up here at eye level, okay? This is my workspace up here. I put it up here at eye level. I insert the magazine. I use my finger here to index it. I can use it up front or I can use it on the side, whichever works, index it. Gets it quickly up there where I can see it and puts it into the gun, okay? Now I don't have a loaded magazine. Shameful. Which gun do I have? I got the nine millimeter. I want the 40 cal. I got two guns that are identical. That was stupid, wasn't it? So here's the 40 cal. I insert it. I give it a smack up here in my workspace. Did you give it a smack? 
Spank it. There you go. Give it a smack. Now I'm going to reach across the top. I am not going to do this. I am not going to do this. Why am I not going to do this? It's a weaker grip. I'm extending the gun out that's unloaded to the bad guy. This is a stronger grip. It's in tighter to my body. I have control of it. I can spin away from the bad guy. I can use my lower body strength as opposed to an upper body strength, which is weaker. Cycle the slide, come back in to the bad guy who's trying to grab the gun, shoot his feet off and work my way up and he'll let go and back up. You shoot somebody's feet off, they tend to let go and back up. It's just human nature, okay? I have better grip and control of the gun. And then here's the most important part for the ladies and the weaker guys among us. It takes less body strength because you're doing a push-pull action at the same time. 50% push, 50% pull. A lot less body strength. I only had one round loaded. Thank you. Okay, so you're gonna reach over, grab, push, pull, and let go. Let go. So if you ride that slide forward, you're gonna jam the gun. Don't do that. Reach over, push, pull, let go. Slam shut, that's what you want. George, reach over, push, pull, let go. That's it. All right, firearm is ready to fire and go, okay? So that action is more reliable for the gun. Give me another one of those 40s, the silver's in the front. It's more reliable, less strength, keeps the gun in closer to your body, more controllable if somebody's trying to take it away from you. And here's why I don't carry an uncocked, unloaded gun. I may not have two hands. I may be fighting somebody off so that when I draw that gun, I need to know it's gonna go bang. If I'm fighting somebody off, there are tricks. I can use my holster or I can use the front slide to maybe find that spot and cock the gun and get it back into the fight. I can use my belt, okay? I can use the corner of a table. I don't wanna deal with that. I want to draw that gun, pull the trigger, have it go bang. Maybe disengage the safety. Unless I'm carrying a 1911, the safety's not on. I carry most days the gun that Annie has in her hand. It has a safety. I think that's the first time that safety's ever been engaged. I don't use it. This is my safety. A safety is a mechanical device that can fail. So because this gun has a self-defense trigger on it that you have to mean to pull that trigger, I don't use the safety. George, that Glock doesn't have an external safety. It has a trigger. You see the center of that trigger? That little segment in there? That's the safety. m and probably don't either, does it? The shield? Does Mine didn't have a safety. no the M and P? Um, where's the M and P forty? You've got it. No, I got a Smith and Wesson. Yeah, this particular one does not have a safety. They do make a model that does, but that one doesn't. So it just so depends on the gun. This little gizmo? That's the other side of the magazine release. Oh, okay. Okay, so now I'm going to have you drop the magazine. So you're going to do that with that thumb. And the reason for that is you want to do it again in the firing position. Just drop it right into your hand. So. Yep. Okay, I'll take your magazines. So let me ask you, is your gun loaded or unloaded? Unloaded. Is it? No, I haven't checked. Oh, yours was loaded. Is yours loaded? Oh, yours was loaded. George, is yours loaded? Loaded. Okay. So just because you dropped the magazine didn't unload the gun. So put your magazines back in. Where's your magazine? 
Put your magazine back in. Cycle your slide. Okay. Now I want you to intentionally unload your guns because they are all loaded. So drop your magazine. You're hard on those magazines. Wait. One at a time. What I want you to do is I want you to rotate the gun over so that you can catch the round in your hand as you lock the slide open. I thought I loaded that one. Careful where you're pointing it. So why did I give you the guns that I gave you? I gave George the easiest one. There's a reason for this. Not every gun is going to fit every person. Not every gun that husbands buy for their wives is the right fit. In fact, never. When you buy a wife a gun, it is never the right fit. Don't buy her a gun you like. Don't buy her the gun that the little lady you think will be a good fit for her. The little lady. Notice I did this? Okay. Any guy who thinks that there's a gun that a woman can't handle, I would like to introduce you to my friend Julie Golob. She just won U.S. Nationals for the 12th time. She's the captain of Team Smith & Wesson. She's a world champion shooter and she can shoot any gun ever made. Okay? So don't tell me that there's a gun that's too much for the little lady or not enough for the little lady. There's a good fit for the little lady. Okay, did you roll it out? Mm -hmm. Lock it open. So the goal that I want you to be able to do is lock that slide open. You're going to roll it over. Lock that slide open. That is a skill you must do to get your permit. So if you could demonstrate that for me. You're going to push up with your thumb on this and engage it in that notch. Good. You got it. George, you got it. You got it. Did you do it? See that little notch right there? Mm -hmm. See that little lever right there? Mm -hmm. Okay, come over here for me. You're going to push back on this and engage that into that notch. Go ahead and set that down and you can have a seat. I'm tight on space. Bingo! You did it. You did it with the hardest gun up here to do it with, too. Yeah, that gun's way too big. The good news about this gun, as I mentioned, is that back strap can be changed out. This is the larger one that's got a laser grip in it. They make a small one, small, medium, large. So just because this grip doesn't work for you doesn't mean that all of them won't. Dang it. Thing keeps going to sleep on me. All right, next row. And you. We'll, we'll divide it up that way. Come on down here. By the way, nail polish. It's a nice color. It's a great color. Same color as the bullets. I'll bring this over here where it's actually easier for me to get to. Okay, go ahead and load them in. And close them so that they will be in the firing position. Nice. Mm, where am I at? There we are. Well done. I can't see. Yep, excellent. So how did you know that's the way they rotated? I gave it a little half cock on the trigger to see which way it ended. <laughs> you cheated. How did you know? Correct. You, you read the dimple on the side. How did you know? Dimple. Read the dimple on the side. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead and extend them out. Megan, I want you to fire in double action position. Excellent. Tell me your name again. Brad. Brad, I want you to fire in single action. Good. And you are Charlie. Charlie. Fire in double action. Everybody fire in single action. 
Excellent. Everybody fire in double action. Everybody open your cylinder, spin it, and then close it so that it will be in the firing position. Good. Everybody unload your revolvers. Got one of you use the handle. I'm left-handed, so I'm trying to figure <laughs> Oh, you are left-handed? Yeah, oh, that's fun. the left-handed handle. All right, so the handle, push the button, take your two fingers, push them through, hang the gun like that. That's the handle. And then you can use your hand to cram it down. All right, so that is the handle. Okay. And I haven't figured out how to do that with... Yeah, you, it, unless you have a left-handed revolver, it's pretty hard to do. Yeah. It can be done, but it's it takes a little practice. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll always leave, leave it open. Yeah. Like that one should be open, and that one should be open. I keep playing with them and put them. bad instructor. Okay, this one is a pain because it. Only stays open on an empty magazine, but I don't know. Let's see, what should we give you? Give you the M and P. All right, so go ahead and load your magazines. Good, you guys all set them down. You know how many times I've done classes where everybody's going, <laughs> set them on the table, put them in the holster, if you have one. You know what a holster is? It's a darn good place to store your gun. I, I, I see people with holsters on our, on our shooting range and they're like, put it in a holster. Really? I don't strong enough. <laughs> you are. You are strong enough. Here's your trick. <laughs> that will give you force behind the, the, the magazine. All right, so I knew somebody would do it eventually. Mm -hmm. So H and K, uh, there's an H and K up here. Very expensive firearms, very nice firearms. They were doing a photo shoot. They hired a photo agency in New York City to do their catalogs and shoot their, their photography for their catalog. Twice, not once, twice H&K published catalogs with the magazines loaded backwards on the cover. Not once, but twice. So Charlie has just demonstrated to us how that could happen, okay? So the magazines were loaded backwards. So the rule of thumb is always the round part of the cartridge faces the round part of the magazine. If you're ever in doubt about how to load those. So you're always gonna load the round part of the cartridge to the round part of the magazine, like that. And even 1911 magazines, they're pretty square and, and clunky and blocky. Stick a little round tab on, just so you can figure that out. Okay, go ahead and load your magazines into your firearms. Very good. Reach over the top and try to keep your hands clear of the ejection port when you're doing that. You're a lefty again, so mm -hmm. you get to do it that way. And make sure you're letting that slide slam shut. Slam shut. Let it go. There you go. Grab the top. Pull it back, slam shut. So the trick that I try to teach people, if I can find the 40 cal, I got my mags mixed up with these two identical guns. The trick I try to teach people when you're doing this is reach for your ear. 
So keep your guns pointed that direction, but look back over here at me. I'm gonna feed the magazine in, okay? I'm gonna reach across the top, and I'm gonna reach for my ear and let the gun go. See where my ear is back here? This hand is coming up here. I'm gonna, that's how much force I want. Am I gonna hurt this gun? No, because every time I pull the trigger, it does that, and it slams shut. Now it stayed open because I ran out of rounds to throw on the floor. But. All right, go out ahead and drop your magazines. Okay, set your magazines down on the table. Are those guns loaded or unloaded? Loaded. loaded. How do you know? So we shucked one in. Paid attention. Are you sure? No, but I'm going to treat it like it's loaded. That's the answer. That's the answer I want. I don't know, but I'm going to treat it like it's, oh, yes, it's loaded. Yes, it's loaded. Yes. Even if it wasn't, yes, it's loaded. Okay, go ahead and empty the rounds out. Try to lock the slide open. So if you tip it like this and push up with your thumb, because you need to push that into that notch. I gave you the hardest one. What if I can't? Am I even reaching? Push it that way. Keep it pushed up. So, why did I give her the hardest gun? Oh, by the way, don't fill out any paperwork yet. So she would feel more confident that she can do it. I gave her the hardest gun because this is a popular, popular gun for people to buy for women. Women have shorter thumbs and less thumb strength. It can be done, but you have to adjust your grip. Which gun is that? This is the M&P Shield. Shield. So you have to adjust your grip. Okay. So this may not be possible, but this may be. Okay. While you push up. You need to slide that back to engage into the notch. Okay. And you can't. It's really hard to disengage it that way. You'll feel it click. You gotta hold it up. <coughs> Are you pushing it? Oh, I'm not pushing it back far enough. There you go. <laughs> That's it. You got it. All right, have a seat. Next group, or next three. Two, three, James. Oh, I'm gonna have fun. I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a fun thing. All right. You get Dirty Harry. You get Dirty Harriet. And you get Little Baby. I need rounds. Three. 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 All right, go ahead and load your three rounds in. Close your cylinder so that it will fire if they were live rounds. Okay. Yours is good, yours is not. Yours is good. Correct. So you have to know the rotation direction, and the way you do that is read the dimple. Okay. Okay. Go ahead and James, fire in the double action position. Okay. What's your name? Ron. Ron? Tanner. Tanner. Tanner, go ahead and fire in the single action position. Ron, go ahead and fire in the single action position. Okay, go ahead and unload. Oh, so close. So close. You did it. You started it, and then you backed out. You had to handle. One day somebody will get it. All right, simple. Revolvers are easy. All right, we're gonna have some fun. Yeah, 
why not? I haven't done the Glock 26 yet. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's why I gave it to you. Uh, there's a magazine somewhere. There it is. Okay. Go ahead and load your magazines. You mean nine out of forty? Yes, I did. Told you we we're gonna have some fun. I know. Go ahead and load your, load your magazines. This is See, everybody's paying attention. This is no fun. What happened? Wrong. Wrong what? I mean, it's 49. Everybody paid attention. Not one of you tried to load the gun. Darn it. I was hoping one of you would load 40s into 9 or 9 into 40. That's no fun. Oh, I didn't give you 40s? Did you give it three? Yeah. Well, darn it. Remember I said we were going to have fun? That was no fun. Nobody tried it. I was waiting to see one of you load the 9 into the 40 or the 40 into the 9. All right, you got them loaded? So bring them up into your working area. Bring them right up here in front of your face, just like that. The reason for that is you can keep situational awareness by looking at the bad guy while you're reloading and you're getting your ammunition up here in front of your eyes where you can see what you're doing. So you're not doing that, okay? Get it up here in your working space. Keep situational awareness, keep an eye on your bad guy, bring it up here in your workspace. Same thing when you go to take it out, bring it up here. I actually chuck them. When I draw and change the magazines, I chuck them. And then my arm comes around and I do that, okay? All right, got your magazines loaded into your firearms. Reach across the top, pull it back. There you go, let it go. Excellent, drop your magazines. Literally, go ahead and set them down. No, no, keep the guns. Set the magazines down. Are the guns loaded? Yes. Yes. So what I'd like you to do is rotate the gun over, lock the slide open with your hand over the ejection port and catch that round as it just falls out into your hand. Excellent. What don't I want to see? Point out yourself. Well, I don't want to see that. What I don't want to see is that nonsense, okay? <laughs> And, and the reason I don't want to see that, and I've seen this happen, it's rare, it's really rare, but I have seen it happen. I have seen that live round come out, strike the corner, and go off, uncontained by the chamber. All right? It's really rare. It's hard to get that to just hit perfectly on that primer, but it's possible. Don't do that. Okay? None of you are that cool. I am not that cool. I am not, uh, 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 well, what's his name? Denzel Washington Cool. He did that in training day. Okay? All right, we're going to take a 10 minute break. So, this is a rim fire cartridge over here, and it consists of the projectile, which is the bullet, the casing, the powder, and the primer. In a rim fire, the entire base of the cartridge is the primer. In a center fire, you have the same elements, the projectile, the casing, the powder, and the primer, but the primer is contained in a center cup and not the entire base. The case is a metal cylinder. It's usually made of brass, but sometimes it's made out of steel um, or another material. It's closed on one end and it contains the other components such as the primer, the power, and the bullet. The primer is an impact sensitive chemical compound used for ignition. It used to be made of a mercury uh, fulminate and now it's made of a different type of salt that's impact sensitive but less toxic and less corrosive. There's in fact a new ammunition that just came out called Syntec that uses a different kind of primer uh, 
substance altogether that's ever been used before that's far cleaner, far more reliable, and burns hotter. Um, the primer is contained inside the rim of the case's base on a rim fire. On a center fire, the primer is contained in a small metal cup and is located in the center of the case's base. The powder charge is a fast burning chemical compound that's used as a propellant and is contained inside the case body. It is actually not gunpowder. It used to be gunpowder back 100 years ago. That's what I'm looking for. I want to get that out of the way. Um, it's made out of a nitrocellulose. It's a gun cotton that is compressed and uh, treated with graphite to keep it from sticking together. It's smokeless now. Old gunpowder or black powder was very corrosive, very smoky. If you had 200 guys on a battlefield all shooting at one time, you couldn't see your nose in front of your face. It was just a wall of smoke. The stuff now still has some smoke, but it's far less smoky than it used to be, so they call it smokeless. Um, the bullet is a projectile. It's usually made out of lead. Sometimes it's covered with a layer of copper or other metal and is located at the mouth of the case. The ammunition that I carry daily is solid copper. There is no lead in it at all. It's completely copper. If you're shooting a shotgun, there's another element that's part of the cartridge that's called the wad. It's a plastic cup inside of the shotgun cartridge and it's used to contain the shot or projectiles for use in a shotgun. Not really relevant for concealed carry, but it is relevant for ammunition. Cartridge firing sequence. When you pull the trigger of the pistol, it will cause the firing pin to hit and ignite the primer. The flame that's generated by the primer ignites the powder in the cartridge. The powder burns very rapidly and produces a high volume of gas, and these expanding gashes pull the, push the bullet out of the cartridge case and propel it out of the fist pistol barrel at a high rate of speed, anywhere of 800 to 4,000 feet per second. The, the gas is very important in a semi-automatic operation because it also causes the operation of the gun to, to work. The gas pushing out on the bullet push it forward, but pushing backward cause the action to cycle, which causes the ejected, the spent case to be ejected and the slide to come forward again on a spring to pick up the next round from the magazine and load into the chamber. When you are dealing with ammunition, you also need to be safe. So we talked about gun safety. We also need to talk about ammunition safety. You want to inspect the ammunition for safety flaws and imperfections. Any round that I'm going to carry in a gun that I carry for self-defense, I visually inspect every round before I carry it. I want to make sure there's no cracks in the case that's going to allow gas to escape. I want to make sure that there's no deformations to the bullet itself that are going to cause it to either uh, feed incorrectly, get jammed, or to fly imperfectly. As it goes down the barrel, it can have uh, accuracy issues because of deformations to the bullet. And those can occur over time, not necessarily just when you pull them out of the box brand new, but loading, unloading, for carry, for storage, for you know, changing environments, for shooting uh, target ammunition and then putting back in your carry ammunition. They can all cause deformations to the bullet, cracks in the case. Uh, rim can have deformations that can cause the the round to jam and not eject properly, this little rim at the top, at the bottom. So I check all of those. Um, can we hit that light again? So we're going to have some fun here. I tried to have you all have some fun and load the wrong ammunition on that last group. I, I gave everybody the wrong ammunition. Nobody loaded it. Everybody caught it. So I was kind of impressed by that. But I'm going to talk to you about some differences in ammunition that you're going to encounter and some different things you're going to see. So for years I carried a 45 and the only reason I actually recently switched to a 9mm is I wanted some greater capacity and the quality and the effectiveness of ammunition has improved drastically in the past couple of years so that you're getting the same performance out of some of the 9mm that are out there now that you used to have to carry a 45 to get. So I can carry more rounds and still get the same performance. So, how many people here are familiar with 45? You've heard of the 45, right? Which one? Well, 45 auto, 45 long gold. Correct. So, there are certain ammunitions you have to know the specif the, with specificity which ammunition you want. So, the first one we'll talk about is the 45. 
So when we talk about 45, we're talking about 0.45 of an inch between the lands and the grooves in the barrel, right? It is just a size. It isn't a cartridge designation. To make it a cartridge designation, I lost my little eraser. To make it a cartridge designation, you need more information. So when you go to buy ammunition, if you go to the gun store and you say, I need some 45, they're gonna say, which one? And you gotta know, right? So is it 45 A C P? Is it 45 Long Colt or Colt? Is it 454 Kazool or Kazool? I can't write sideways. How about 458 SOCOM? How do you know? How do you, how do you know what your gun eats? Any gun made after 1986, it will be printed on the side of the gun, either on the barrel or on the slide. Right there. See that 45 auto? Mm -hmm. 45 auto? Okay. So ACP stands for Automatic Cartridge Pistol. It's one of those military designations, nomenclature things, you know, animal, vegetable, mineral. They kind of do it in a weird way, but Automatic Cartridge Pistol. All right, so a 45 ACP is a 45 auto. Might be designated as that. Uh, how about 380? I have a gun on this table. It doesn't say 380 on it. This gun is made in Germany. It is a Sig Sauer. And you see right there what it says? Nine millimeter Kurtz. Nine millimeter Kurtz. Kurtz is German. What's it mean, Mama? Short. Richard's German's better than my mom's. <laughs> they did a mission in Germany. So nine millimeter Kurtz. It's nine millimeter short. So if you were to go find ammo for that gun, would you find it in the United States? Sure you would. It's 380 ACP. You just need to know that. It's not listed on the gun. Uh, this gun right here will shoot two rounds. So will that one. So will that one. It will shoot. It's chambered for 357 Magnum. But it will also interchangeably shoot just fine 38 Special. However, a 38 Special gun will not shoot 357 Magnum. The cartridge is too long, the cylinder won't close. So if a gun is chambered for 357 Magnum, it will shoot 38 Special just fine. If it's chambered for 38 Special, it will not shoot 357 Magnum. They're not reverse compatible. Okay? It's important stuff to know. And by the way, this is not in your pamphlet. So if you want to write it down someplace, I would recommend it. It's not in what the state gives you. Um, here's a favorite rifle round, especially for self-defense. The number one rifle round for self-defense. And a lot of people think they're identical, and they are not. The military designation is 5.56 NATO. The civilian designation is 0.223. You may also see 5.56 by 39.
These are the most common self-defense calibers for rifle. Wow, that's good coffee. They are not the same. These two are the same. They're just different ways of writing that same thing. But these are not the same. So a cartridge, a rifle cartridge like this, has a neck. And it has a base. And then it has a bullet. This neck, this shoulder of this neck right here, has a slightly different angle on a 5.56 and a 2.23. So any 5.56 rifle that's chambered in 5.56 can shoot 2.23 just fine. No problem whatsoever. If a rifle is chambered in 2.23 and it has loose tolerances, it can shoot 5.56, okay. You're going to lose a little bit of accuracy. You're going to have a little bit of difference in, in compression. Uh, and you're going to actually fire form the brass to the chamber. So you're going to change the dimensions of the brass after you shoot it. But if you have something that's point two two three, with this acronym after it, SAMI, Standards and Standard Arms Measurements International something. I can't remember what SAMI stands for. It's a competition gun. It's a gun designed for competition with a very tight tolerance in the chamber. And it will not shoot the 5.56. It will jam it up. It will ruin the gun. It will cause all kinds of problems. So you have to make sure that you're shooting 223 ammo out of it. Not 5.56, 223 interchangeably. If you see something that's 2 2 three wild, they've fixed the accuracy and compression differences that you get out of that chamber so that 5.56 five, and 223 shoot identically out of it. That's what those differences are. All right, this gun it's a revolver. It's a big revolver. It was designed by some guys out of Alaska to shoot grizzly bears. Um, it will shoot three calibers. In fact, kind of four calibers. It will shoot 454 Casul. It'll shoot 44 Magnum. It'll shoot 45 Long Colt. This board really wants to move. And in a pinch, I'm writing like a left-handed, it'll shoot a 410 shotgun shell. So long as that 410 shotgun shell is two and a half inches. So your typical 410 shotgun shell is two and three quarters inches. They've cut them down and made them specifically two and a half inches for pistols. So those are some ammunition situations you can get into. Tell me the difference between these. I'm working on it. I'm going to get out of the way in a second. Uh, what am I missing? Oh. Yeah. What's the difference between those? All exactly the same. They are the same ammo, just different designation for each one. Nine millimeter is the diameter of the bullet. 19 millimeters is the length of the case. So, that being said, what is this? What are those? Smaller. That's 380 ACP. That's 9mm Makarov.
It's a Russian uh, cartridge for a Russian pistol. You'll see them at pawn shops for 99 bucks. And occasionally you can find ammo for them once in a blue moon. So. What is that third one in the five there? This one? Nine by 19. Third oh, third one? Nine, para, nine millimeter parabellum. <coughs> parabellum is Latin for war. For war. It was designed for the military round. Same as the Luger. Same as the 9x19. It's still actually, you may also see it 9mm NATO. It's the round that's currently used by our US military. And NATO. And NATO. <laughs> and the FBI. The FBI just went back to 9mm. So when you, the, the point that I want you to get out of this is when you go to buy ammo, read your manual that comes with your gun and see what ammo it takes. Here's another one that you need to know about. I wish I, I need a bigger eraser. We have a rag or a paper towel down here. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of designations on ammunition that you need to know about. And sometimes your gun will be rated for them, and sometimes your gun won't be rated for them. So let's say we have a nine millimeter, and we have a nine millimeter plus P, and a nine millimeter plus P plus. So plus P means plus power. Plus P plus means double the power. Okay, so sometimes your gun may be a nine millimeter, that's the caliber that's listed on it, but it's not rated for plus P or plus P plus. You need to know that and the manufacturer's guidelines will be in the manual to tell you whether this... Is it like that shotgun that I shot when I had that plus? No, that was a high brass, high brass load. <laughs> All right, so for an example, this particular gun, it's, it says on the side, caliber 45, but it's not. I've replaced all the springs in it, and I shoot a 454 SMC on it, a 450 SMC out of it, short magnum cartridge. It's a 45 plus P plus P plus. It's actually made from a 308 shell that's been cut down, and double the powder has been poured into it. And you have to replace all the springs, or you'll blow the gun apart. So... I did it again, this blasted thing. Um, so you have to know, is your gun rated for enhanced ammunition or plus power ammunition? Okay. One of the ways you can tell what type of ammunition you're dealing with is the head stamp. So I'm gonna randomly pass out ammunition. You got two. That's all right. You'll get two. All right. So if you look at your round on the base where there would be a primer, it should tell you what that ammunition is. What do you have? 40 Smith and Wesson. 40 Smith and Wesson. Oh, that's, that's an important too. Um, one question I get asked a lot, well, I have a Sig Sauer, and it says that it's a 40 caliber, but all I can find is ammunition for Smith & Wesson. Well, 40 is the diameter. SW stands for Smith & Wesson. That does not mean it can only be used in a Smith & Wesson gun. It means that Smith & Wesson developed that ammunition round and built a gun around it. They developed the cartridge first, then they built the gun. So you'll see 270 Winchester. You'll see 8 millimeter Remington. Or my favorite, 300 Remington Ultra. I can't write today. Ultra Mag. Rum. So the company name in the cartridge means that's the company that developed the cartridge. It does not mean that it can only be used in that brand of gun. All right, because gun manufacturers also create 
ammunition. In fact, one of the largest gun manufacturers in the world with the longest history in the United States is Winchester, and they're the largest manufacturer of ammunition in the United States. So, you know, that does not mean that you can't use Smith & Wesson ammunition in a Ruger or a Sig Sauer or whatever, okay? So you can see what that ammunition is on the head stamp. What do you have? I have a 357 Magnum CBC. Okay. What do you have? I've got a Winchester 9mm. No, it can't be Winchester. Uh, nine. Why can't it be Winchester? Luger. Why can't it be Winchester? I, I guess it can if they made it. <laughs> yep, they sure did. Win. Win is Winchester. So that will tell you what type of, of cartridge that you have. Then the other way is on the firearm itself. If it's made since 1986, it will be marked on the firearm. Now, by the way, is this a 22 caliber right here? No, that's a Glock model 22. The caliber will be right there. And it will tell you that says SW, Smith & Wesson, but that's a Glock. You can't put Smith & Wesson ammunition in a Glock, can you? Yeah, you can. And then the other way you'll see it is on the box itself. And there's a lot of information that's here. This tells you the caliber, 40 S and W, 40 Smith and Wesson. This right here, 155 grains is the weight of the bullet. And the heavier the bullet, the more recoil you're gonna feel when you fire it. And then JHP is jacketed hollow point. So there's some acronyms you need to know as well. The two most important ones you're going to see are FMJ and JHP. This is full. Wow, this tripod is terrible. Want me to hold it for you? No. Full metal jacket and jacketed hollow point. Typically, they can be broken down very simply. Your full metal jacket ammunition is cheaper, it's lower powered, and it's typically your target practice ammunition. Your jacketed hollow point, to give you an idea of the difference, and I painted it with nail polish, trying to make it stand out as a dummy round. That's a jacketed hollow point. That's a full metal jacket. Go ahead and pass those around. The jacketed hollow point is going to expand. So let's say this is our bullet. And it has a hole in the front, as you'll see when it comes around to you. What that does is it has segmented pedals. And when it hits soft tissue, those segmented pedals are going to open up and they're going to double the diameter in some cases or enlarge the diameter of the hole that it makes. As that cartridge goes into your soft tissue, it creates two wound cavities. One is called the temporary wound cavity. It's the expansion of air and it blows up like a balloon inside. And the permanent wound cavity is actually the hole that's made by the projectile going through. This causes massive tissue damage. This causes tissue to go away. It punches a hole through it. You want something that's going to cause extreme shock as well as extreme penetrative uh, power and force. You need something that will go through denim, leather, bone to get in there, and then you need something that's going to expand and create a massive wound cavity. This is gonna cause instant shock to the body and cause the fight to go out of somebody, whether through death, exsanguination, or just, ow, stop it, I don't like that, that hurts, okay? So the jacketed hollow point is going to accomplish that. The other thing that that jacketed hollow point is going to do, it's going to dump its energy 
and stop inside of the bad guy. Whereas your, your full metal jacket is going to continue on over penetration. So remember when we were talking about knowing your target and what's beyond your target, and I said to you, if you shoot the bad guy and he's standing in front of a schoolyard full of children, and that bullet doesn't stop and stay inside of him, now you've endangered all those people on the other side. And you have gone from hero to zero, from defender to criminal. So carry jacketed hollow point bullets. Carry Barnes TAC XP bullets. That's my advice. That's what I carry. There it is. Barnes TAC XP. Solid copper. Scariest bullet I've ever seen in my life. I would not want to be shot with it for anything. All right, here's some things you're looking for in your ammunition. I'm gonna pop on the table here. You're looking for ammunition, number one is to be reliable. You need that ammunition to work and go bang every time you pull the trigger. If there's any doubt about that ammunition, it needs to go away. You need ammunition that is absolutely 100% reliable. Um, it needs to not only go bang when you want it to, but it needs to extract properly and load properly. It needs to be controllable. You need to be able to fire multiple shots, multiple rounds, still manage the recoil and maintain accuracy. It's not like the movies. You shoot each bad guy one time and they go down and they're done. No. Nuh-uh. They're done when they decide they're done. And there's four kinds of stops. And if you take our advanced uh, concealed carry class, we'll talk to you about those four different types of stops things that make a bad guy stop in the, in the four situations. But it's not going to be a situation where you shoot one time and they're going to stop. They might. They might just stop. They might just stop when they see the gun. They might run away peeing themselves. You can't count on that. You shoot until that threat is stopped, until they are no longer a threat to you. You need to have stopping power. And this is a, a term that has a lot of controversy around it. Stopping power, knockdown power. You need to, to bring enough gun to the gunfight that you take the fight out of that bad guy. That you make it so he does not want to or is incapable of continuing to fight you and be a threat to you. You need to have something that is accurate. The ammunition and the firearm work together with your fundamentals to create something that you can repeat over and over again and hit accurately. Uh, it, most of your attacks are going to happen in low or no light. You see, I carry a flashlight. I carry a flashlight every day, everywhere I go. Um, you also have to take into account your night vision. If you have a muzzle flash that blinds you when you shoot, then you're not effective for more than one shot in low light. So you need something that has a, uh, a, a low muzzle flash, and typically your self-defense ammo, your full metal jacket, or your, uh, your jacketed hollow point ammo is going to have a lower muzzle flash. Um, hollow points, they open up and expand in diameter upon impact, the more efficiently transfers energy and also prevents over penetration or complete penetration that can endanger the lives of others. That's your self-defense ammo. That's what you're looking for to carry every day. That is the expensive stuff, all right? The cheap stuff is the non-expanding type. It's full metal jacket. It has less powder inside of it. It has less cost, tends to be dirtier, tends to have a higher muzzle flash. Um, it's the stuff you practice with. But let me tell you this, before I carry ammunition for self-defense, I put 100 rounds of it through a gun. That's 20 bucks for 20 rounds, 25 bucks for 20 rounds. You're gonna spend some money, you're gonna spend 100 bucks, you're gonna spend 120 bucks. But I'm trusting my life to it. So where I wanna you, know. Where do you do that at? Just out our, our little gun range? Here? Yeah, just go out to our range. What do you shoot? Cardboard. I'm more concerned about how that gun is performing, how it feels in my hand, how it feeds, uh, the reliability of it. Is there anywhere else you can go besides there? Rowdy's Range is Yeah, Rowdy's or the Southern Utah Shooting Sports Park down in Hurricane. We're out in the desert. Just get out of the city limits. So when you're storing ammunition, you want to keep it in the factory box or a container that can be properly labeled. I, I do bulk ammo. I load ammo. So I, I have ammo cans full and they're all labeled. I know this one's got 357. This one's got 9 millimeter. This one's got 380. 
Um, you're gonna store it in a, in a cool, dry place, free from extreme temperature variations. So our guys that were over in Iraq were shooting ammunition that was loaded during Vietnam. The guys in Vietnam were shooting, shooting ammunition that was loaded during World War II. If it was stored properly and, and kept in a nice, dry place, it'll be just fine in 100 years, and 1,000 years, and 10,000 years. If it's kept dry and, and in a nice environment, it'll be just fine. You want to store the ammunition separately from the guns and so it's not accessible to unauthorized persons, especially children. All right, keep the guns and the ammo separate. There's, you guys familiar with survival training and the, the fire pyramid? <coughs> so in order to get fire, you need three things. What's that? Heat, oxygen, fuel. Heat, oxygen, and fuel, that's correct heat, oxygen, and fuel. That's what you need to get a fire. In order to have a firearms accident, you need three things. You need a person. Can't shoot somebody if there's no person there. You can't have somebody actuate the gun if there's no person there. You need a firearm. You need ammunition. You need those three things in order for an accident to occur with a firearm. You take out any one of those, no more accident. So keep the ammunition away from the guns. When you're storing them, keep them separate. I have an ammo cabinet and I have a gun safe, and they're separate. When I clean guns, the ammo's not in the room. The ammo goes in another room altogether. I take that piece out of the equation, okay? Never submerge or keep your ammunition away from acid salts and other chemicals that can cause corrosion. So if you carry on a daily basis, there is a horrible source of salt that it comes in contact with your ammunition on a regular basis. Anybody know what it is? Sweat. Sweat. You are a salt making machine and that will degrade the effectiveness and the, in the uh, efficacy of your ammunition over time. So every six months I take my carry ammunition out and I shoot it. It reinforces to me what that ammunition feels like when it comes out of the gun. It replaces it, rotates it out. I put new ammunition in. I recommend that. Never submerge in water exposed to any solvents, petroleum products, bore cleaner, ammonia, or other chemicals. These chemicals can penetrate the cartridge and cause the primer or the powder to deteriorate. Gun cleaners are designed to dissolve bullets. So if you're cleaning and you have the gun and the ammunition in the room while you're cleaning and they come into contact with these solvents that are designed to dissolve bullets, what's going to happen to them? They're going to dissolve and they're not going to be effective. So it's another reason to keep the ammunition away from where you're cleaning your guns. Uh, I, I rotate mine every six months. Take it out there, shoot it up, reinforces what it's going to feel like, gives me new ammo, and I go from there. And again, I inspect every round before I put it into a magazine and carry it in my gun. Some malfunctions that you can encounter. One is a misfire. You pull the trigger, it goes click or it goes pop. It doesn't go bang, okay? A misfire could be a hang fire. You pull the trigger, it goes click, bang! There's a pause, a perceptible delay between the time that the ignition of the primer was initiated and the ground went off. You could have a squib load. Only the primer goes off and not the powder because you clean the gun and the solvents that dissolve bullets got into the powder and dissolved it. And when you pull the, it goes and it launches the bullet out of the case and down the barrel, but doesn't leave the barrel. Now you have an obstructed barrel. Now it go boom when you pull the trigger. So if you have a misfire or a hang fire, you assume every misfire is a hang fire for at least 30 seconds. The assumption is this is this always for at least 30 seconds. Do not open that chamber up and go trying to fix it and clear it and everything else. Tap, rack, reassess, all that nonsense. Wait 30 seconds. Get that finger off the trigger. Because the last thing you want to have happen is, let's say it does go pop and squibs and puts that, that bullet into the chamber, into the barrel. And you flinch and pull that trigger because your finger was on the trigger, right? Your booger hook was on the bang switch. Now you've blown the gun up in your face. Pay attention to what you're doing. Get your finger off the trigger. Follow your four rules, right? Uh, if you have a squib load, you've got to check that barrel to make sure. I took a student out, we were doing night shooting, and it was this gun. 
We call this one the panty dropper, by the way. Women love this gun. I don't know what it is about this gun, but the guy I bought it from, I bought it on a pawn. He might buy it back and then after I found out its powers, so you're never getting this gun back. <laughs> but she was shooting it and all of a sudden it went pop and she was ready to pull that trigger again. She was going. I'm like, stop! And I actually had to oil this thing up and drill it to get the bullet out. It was wedged in there so hard I could not get the bullet out. I couldn't push it out. I had to drill it out with a drill press. So I'm getting good at that. <laughs> I've had that happen several times. Um, but it would have blown that gun up. It would have peeled that back strap right off and blown that gun up. She could have gotten hurt and I would have lost the panty dropper. Here we go. All right, we're gonna talk about the fundamentals of shooting. I'm gonna give you real quick isosceles weaver and modified isosceles stances. I had a, an instructor, when I got here, I had to get my permit and I took a, a class from one of the instructors here and he spent 30 minutes explaining how the weaver stance is how you shoot at something that's weaving. And that is not what the weaver stance is. It was named for Sheriff Jack Weaver of San Diego, former FBI agent who created it. All right, I wanna get that out of the way in case anybody else has ever heard that because it's absolute nonsense. The isosceles stance is very simple. Remember an isosceles triangle? Look, I drew one. There's an isosceles triangle right there. So imagine that your arms and body form an isosceles triangle. Here's your body and here's your arms. Here's your gun. It looks like this. Extend the elbows all the way out, lock my wrists. I bring my head even with the target and the gun comes up to my eye. I don't move my head. I lock my head on the target and I always move the gun, not my head, okay? My knees are slightly bent. My high knee's sticking out just a little bit. I'm aggressive and forward. I'm reaching out there and trying to touch that guy with the tip of the gun, even if he's 25 yards away. I'm reaching full extension. Transition to trigger, come back, draw, holster. I have a blue gun in my holster. So the typical draw would look like this. That's isosceles. My feet are pointed at the target. Weaver is one foot back, one foot pointed at the target, elbow tucked in, just like this. Head is cocked. This is Weaver stance. We had to break FBI agents of this. So hard. Here's your limitation with the Weaver stance. There's several. First of all, this cocks my body this way. My muscles are pulling on the gun, torquing it this direction. Second, let's say I have a threat that engages me from over there. Okay, no problem. What if I have a threat that engages me from over there? Now I'm having to move my feet. With isosceles, 180 degrees. Weaver, not so much. What's the third problem with it? Especially for federal agents and cops. Body armor. Isosceles, that camera is my threat. My plate is presented directly to that threat. Weaver, where's the weakness in my body armor? Over my heart, under my arm. Don't do the weaver, don't do it. Modified isosceles, same thing, isosceles reaching out, kind of putting one hand back, one foot back, it's kind of lazy man's isosceles. Say you're at the range and you're on your 500th round. All right, <laughs> I'm tired. I'm, I'm kicking back a little bit, relaxing, working on my trigger pull, working on my side alignment. I can work on stance later. One thing we teach in our advanced class is a position is an option and a luxury. Getting in the right shooting position is an option and a luxury. In a real life situation, you could be on the ground, you could be hanging from a ladder, you could be doing anything. If, if you can get into the proper shooting position, that fundamental of the six fundamentals of pistol shooting, 
that's a position that that's a luxury and, and an option, not necessarily a necessity. Work on your other five fundamentals. Those are your important ones. And practice laying on the ground and shooting between your feet or hanging from a ladder and all that crazy top shot stuff. It's a lot of fun. I should shoot your feet off. Well, you have to do it safely. Okay, so this is a, a revolver shooter doing the isosceles stance. Okay, this is the weaver stance. This is all stuff I've already explained, so. Modified isosceles. Okay, so here's your fundamentals of pistol shooting. You've got six of them. Hand grip is the number one. That's why it's number one on the list. Hand grip is your number one priority fundamental to get right. The number one reason people miss, shoot badly, have problems is because they don't hold the gun properly. So we're gonna spend some time. I have actually written a book on how to hold the gun. It's called the Kidder Index. I really actually wrote the book, <laughs> okay? So I'm gonna teach you the Kidder Index and how to properly hold a pistol. You're gonna have it high in your hand up to this web right here. Grip it as high as you possibly can and keep it under the slide because that slide's gonna cycle back. You don't wanna be on top, you want it underneath. You're gonna point your finger at your target. Point that finger. Your mind is pre-programmed. I wanna push that button on top of the, the bullet right there. I just wanna to touch the top of that bullet, right? I can just reach out there and do that. Our mind makes that connection. So if I want to put my gun barrel on the target, I'm looking at my reflection in this, this glass right over here. If I want to put that gun barrel right there instantly, I point at it. I push the buttons on my microwave. I hit the number one button every time because the brain makes that connection. It continues that through. So if I That little logo right there in there in the right corner, okay? I'm just gonna point at it. Instantly, I'm right, oh, right there, okay? I'm not looking at the sights. I'm not using the laser to sight in. I'm just pointing at it, and it goes there. So that's pre-indexing your target. You're doing that using that depth perception that we have. So, Keeping that finger alongside the barrel is not just a safety measure to keep your finger off the trigger, but it also was pre-sighting your gun for you, taking 90% of your sight adjustment out of the picture. They call this point shooting at the, poli at the police academy and in, in the uh, FBI academy. You'd be able to just draw and shoot, point shooting, using that technique. And typically FBI agents are good at it within three yards. Anything beyond three yards, they can't hit because they're accountants with guns. They're not exactly gunfighters. But, so that's your, your grip with one hand right there. This is the Kidder Index. Ready for this? There's a key and there's a slot. Slot and a key. Here's your key right here. This ridge of knuckles. Here's your slot. This line where your palm meets your fingers. You're gonna lay that line on top of that ridge of knuckles. And you're just gonna roll the hands forward and you're gonna point your thumbs also at the target. Your strong hand thumb is on top. And the reason for that is very apparent when you're shooting like a 1911, because your safety is there and you want to be able to push that down and hold it down. Okay? That is your Kidder Index. That sets for you the proper grip. Then you're gonna lock your wrists. You're going to push this hand forward as you pull back with this hand. It creates dynamic tension, push, pull. Elbows locked out, arms reaching out as far as you can, head locked on the target, gun comes up to the eye. That's your shot. That's the wrong gun. Nope. Not what I wanted to do. I'm gonna go through each one of these, so I, yeah, that's fine. Breath control. So once your sights are on the target, you're gonna take in a breath. Hold it for a second, not five, six, seven, eight seconds. 
let out just enough to be comfortable, press that trigger. It says squeeze, that's what the state says, but you're pressing the trigger. You're not squeezing anything. You're pressing gently, steadily back. Let that out, take a deep breath, repeat for each shot. So lining up the firearm sights is how you aim it. There's a little notch on the back, there's a little peg on the front. You put that peg between the notch, line it up on the target, and that's how you aim again. We've got more on that. The front sight is your focus. Find the front sight. He who finds the front sight wins the gunfight. Write that down. <laughs> he who finds the front sight wins the gunfight. You're going to pay, place that lined up sight on the target. You're going to make sure that the top of the front sight is even with the rear sight, not higher, not lower. Make sure there's even space on either side. This is what is not going to look like. What's wrong with this? It's hard to tell with the light, but these are in focus. That is not. The target is in focus. And by the way, this is the most common thing. We get what we call a target-centric sight picture. Because what's going to kill us? Is the front sight going to kill us? No. So what are we going to focus on? The thing that's going to kill us, the target. So we tend to look through that front sight and get focused on that target because that is the threat. That is the thing that's going to kill us. We want to watch that. And there's actually a whole school of thought out there right now and a whole school of training that is teaching people to shoot through that target-centric focus and actually focus on that target when they're shooting instead of the front sight. But this is what you want. You want this to be crystal clear, and this is what you're looking for, that top edge of that sight. That is your focus point. You find that, and you put that on the bad guy, you are going to win. Trigger squeeze is your next fundamental. Trigger. Go back. I, I'm sorry, can you go back to the slide that was incorrect? Because I'm not sure that I saw a difference. It's hard to see with this light. See the focus? Want to turn the lights off? No, it's okay. I just wanted him to explain it to me one more time. So here's the rear sight is in focus, and this is blurry, and the target is blurry. So it's not that he's not aiming correctly. It's it's your point of focus and what your point of focus is going to be. Now, your space right here is good, and you're even along here, which is good, but your point of focus should not be here. It should be right there, that edge. Okay. So it's just it's your, how your eyes are adjusting yep. to it, not where you're... Actually Correct. He's pointing in the right place, but where his eyes are adjusting. Uh -huh. So if I, if I hold a gun up and I look through the sights and I close one of my eyes, it's going to totally shift. And if I close the other eye, it's going to totally shift. So your perspective, that's why I always say lock your head, bring the gun up to your eye. Because if I change my head position, I just change my perspective on the sights. I don't change where the gun's actually pointing. So by locking my head on the target and bringing the gun up, I'm always moving the gun, which changes where the gun points. I'm not changing my perspective on it. And that's the, the purpose of finding that front sight focus. So trigger press, you're only using the tip of your finger. On a, uh, on a revolver, you're going to use a little bit more because you have a larger, harder uh, trigger squeeze. You're going to use this pad back here. And on a semi-auto, you're just going to use that tip. A lot of people want to wrap that finger all the way around that trigger and want to do this. And when you do that, first you're twisting the gun out of your grip properly. You're getting a lot of movement when you pull that trigger. See how much that gun's moving? Versus... A lot less movement that gun's moving back and forth. Your goal in shooting with all these fundamentals is to minimize the movement of the gun as much as you possibly can. Okay, when you fire, you are letting the gun fire. You're not making it fire. That moment of that shot should actually come as a little bit of a surprise to you. You wanna, I don't know how it'll work with these with the weight on them. The plastic ones work a lot better. I do it with empty shell casings, but the bullet might, yeah, make it top heavy. I can do it with the top heavy bullet. I can't even get it to stand up there. The goal, 
maybe less coffee, is to be able to go through that entire trigger cycle without having that fall off. It's better with an empty shell casing because it doesn't have the weight of the bullet toppling it over. But that's a dry fire practice that you can do on your trigger squeeze to see if you're going through that whole cycle. If you can keep that shell casing up there without it bouncing off or falling off, then you're in good shape. You're gonna take up the trigger slack. So when you've got a semi-automatic, there's slack in the trigger. See all that before it fires? So you're gonna take that slack up and then you're gonna gently press until it breaks the shot. Gun's gonna recoil and come up. You're gonna reset. Listen for this when the trigger comes forward. Hear that little click? That's as far forward as I have to go. I don't have to go all the way forward. I just go to the reset point, make my next shot without coming all the way forward or off the trigger. So it's... I keep that trigger pressed back until I'm ready to come forward and get back on target and, and finish that cycle again. Follow through. Anybody ever watch uh, Tiger Woods play golf? He goes up there for a long drive and he gets right to the ball and stops, right? No, he continues through. Same with shooting. You shoot, boom. If you shoot and the gun's right here, you ain't following through. You're driving the gun, you're forcing it, and you're pushing it. So what you want to do is pull that trigger and Uh, you just want to pull that trigger and uh, keep everything exactly the way it is. So we've just been joined by some very scary looking dudes. Uh, how's everybody doing? These are bikers that we have here. So uh, is this a threat right now? How would we know? You know, we just got a bunch of scary looking dudes walking in here. I have a hunch that more than one of them is armed. So how do we know if this was actually a threat right now? If we don't know it's a threat. If you don't know it's a threat? What do you mean? If we, if we don't know that it's not a threat, it is a threat. Potentially. I mean, it's something to be aware of, right? Mm -hmm. Hostile. Now, they're all white, so they're, they can't be threatening because they're all white, right? I mean, only black people are threatening, or Hispanics, right? Hey, hey, one of those. So my point in this, and I, I appreciate these guys, these are all great guys. These are bad, bad bikers, only if you're a child abuser, okay? Um, you can't tell if somebody is a threat by looking at them. You don't know by their color. You don't know by their ethnicity, by their, their clothing, if they're a threat. How do you tell if somebody's a threat? if they're doing something threatening. There's guys going through, through Kroger with, or, you know, or Smith's with an AR-15 strapped over their back, and they go, oh, we know they're not a threat because they're not doing anything threatening. Carrying a gun is not a threat. Acting in a threatening behavior is a threat. And we're gonna get here in just a second to the legal section, which we're, we got a little bit of time to get to. Guys, I appreciate it. I wish I could spend more time on it, but <laughs> you guys rock. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right. I drank so, fold out that door. I'm telling you what. Well, you're married to one of them. So, <laughs> so Dan, before you, if, if something like that really happened, uh huh. And if we, if you didn't know them, and they walked in like that, that's a threat. I'd ask him to have a seat, or can I help him, or, you know. Engage them and find out what well, they want. You're packing a gun. I'm not. My gun's made out of plastic. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to this. I'm not going to the gun. It's made out of plastic. All right. So we're not going to really go out to the range. I know uh, in a lot of the classes that we do on weekends and stuff, we always make that an option. Being a late night weekday class, it's not really an option. But 
if you go out to the range, there are certain different things you can deal with and, and we would be aware of. Um, a failure to fire malfunction would be caused by faulty ammunition. The magazine's not fully seated. It's considered a type one malfunction. I'm going through this with you because the state requires me to, but we're not going to the range, so it's not gonna be really relevant to you. A uh, failure to eject is a stovepipe, a partial ejection is a type two malfunction. Feedway stoppage is a double feed or extractor gummed or broken guide rods. Extractor does not get a good grip on the spent cartridge. Chamber remains blocked, type three malfunction. Failure to go into battery, bad chamber design, weak guide spring, extremely dirty guide uh, rails. Uh, so here's what gets me about this. The state requires me to go through this with you. These are four different types of malfunctions, type one, two, three, and four. The answer to fixing these problems is not the same. Yet the state wants me to teach you tap, invert, rack, and reassess. It's a one size fits all answer for different types of malfunctions. Here's my answer. Know your gun, know the types of malfunctions, know how to clear the types of malfunctions, and when the gun malfunctions, fix it. One size fit all never works unless you have one size fit all malfunctions, and you don't. So learn how to fix your malfunctions. Learn how to operate your gun. There, I met my state requirements. We did that. All right, keep your handguns clean. Uh, some days we come down here and actually in this room we do a handgun cleaning class. And I bring people in and we show them how to take apart their guns and how to clean them properly and oil them and maintain them and, and we do that right here in this room. So learn how to clean your gun. Read the manual that comes with your gun. It's there for a reason. Read it. Keep it. Refer to it. Uh, so I've shown you what is the purpose of a holster? Your gun. It makes a darn fine gun holder, right? Okay, so one of the things I carry concealed every day, have for 20, how many years? I don't know. In cooler weather, I wear a concealment vest. This is made by 511. Actually, everything I'm wearing today is made by 511. I'm a 511 pro staffer, so. This is a concealment vest. It's not an obvious screaming tactical vest. I have a gun, you know. It's not as cool as Captain's Cut, but you know, it gets the job done. It's got all kinds of pockets. It lets me carry all kinds of cool gear. Um, but this is my draw technique right there. And that's a lot of practice, except this is not my right holster. All right. So it's just a matter of sweeping away your cover garment, coming to center. This hand's coming to center midline right here. Sweep, this hand is now ready to accept the forward presentation of the gun. And we're gonna break the draw down into five steps. This hand comes to midline, sweep. Getting that cover garment out of the way. Grip, I'm taking this gun in a shooting grip in the holster. Draw, rotate, present, fire. And it just re reverses. I really need the right holster though, okay? A holster has to, number one, be safe. A holster must be safe. This holster, I've never had a problem with it. There are certain schools in this country that actually have outlawed this holster. They won't allow you to use it. And it's because people don't use their brains. What's rule number one? Guns always loaded. Guns always loaded, right? So even when you're dry fire practicing, it's still loaded. So are you gonna put your booger hook on the bang switch? No. So they can't figure out to push this button that releases the gun, how to do it without sticking their finger in the trigger because they're not properly indexing their finger. So it's not a problem of the holster design, it's a problem of the user design. I use, I've used them for 20 some years and I've never had a problem with them called the Blackhawk Serpa. Great holsters. So it has to be safe. It has to cover the trigger, has to contain the gun, not have it flopping all over the place, dropping all over the place. It needs to be accessible. Where's the worst place to carry a gun? In the backpack. Backpack or purse. Off body carry. Never put a gun in a purse. If I'm a bad guy, I want to do a couple of things. I want to separate you from your means of rescue. 
I want to separate you from your valuables, and I want to separate you from your means of defense. I take your purse. That's going to be my first thing. I'm going to take your purse. All of those things are in there. Take that away from you. Now, I have your gun. I have your driver's license with your address on it. And I have the keys to your house. If I like what I found in your purse, I'm going to come back and get some more. You've armed the bad guy. You've given him your address and the keys to your house. And you've made yourself defenseless. Never carry off your body. Put it on your body. Where's the second worst place to carry? Hold on one second. Let me get this gun out of my... <laughs> really? Really? You're going to... Oh, I'm quick. Yeah, right. Midline, I carry every day. I carry appendix uh, inside the waistband. I didn't bring my, my holster with me today. Um, this is for training. I carry right here in my pants. I have a holster that fits right in there. And I've been carrying lately this gun. And it fits right there. Now, would I just shove a gun like that in my pants? Uh-oh. <laughs> Hold on, I'm gonna get it. Okay, so that's not smart, right? That doesn't contain the gun, that doesn't cover the trigger, that doesn't keep it safe, and it's pointed at a place I kinda like. So, let's not do that. It needs to provide security. So, this gun, doesn't actually fit in that holster. In fact, I don't think I have the gun that does. No, I don't. Uh, so you said you always use that holster? Yep. And well, I have, so it's specific to the model of gun. This holster, I, I have probably 30 of these holsters. I have one for just about every gun pistol I have. So this is the one for the 1911, same holster. Okay. You're not getting it out of there. If somebody tries to steal that, they're not getting it out of there unless they know how. So it's a retention holster. I bend over, the gun's not gonna fall out. It's gonna lock in place. Well, how did you get it out? I know the secret. Push that button right there. But you do it with your whole finger, not your fingertip. Mm-hmm. No, I was getting you a boat, but you know, if you want that instead. All right, then the third, the fourth thing you're looking for is concealment. You need to be able to hide that gun on you. I'm not a huge fan of open carry. First of all, in Utah, the only way you can open carry fully loaded firearm is with a concealed carry permit. And if you can carry concealed, it's always better than open. If I'm a bad guy, I'm gonna shoot the guy with the gun hanging out first, right? He's the obvious threat. So while he's shooting you, I'm going, hello. <laughs> you're, you're a distraction for me at that point. I love it, thank you. <laughs> we, we like distractions. Gives me lots of room to maneuver and operate. Okay, I'm not a lover of, of open carry. Conceal that thing. That's why you're in this class, to get the permit, right? Dumb question. Uh-huh. You showed us where you carry it. Uh-huh. On the front. Do you... But your vest, if you're wearing that vest. If I'm wearing my vest, I carry it over here. Typically when I'm wearing it in the front, I'm wearing a button-down shirt, kind of like that, with hanging, hanging down. But I carry this and this and this and two spare mags and all this stuff. Under a shirt. Under a shirt. Nobody ever knows. Everything's I'm a little bit chug chubby. <laughs> I'm okay with that. So you want to keep it concealed. You want to have it be secure. You want it to be accessible, but you also want it to be safe. Um, your number one consideration on all of that, though, is safety. Your firearm needs to be in a holster or a gun case when you're transporting it. The firearm should be hidden from view and it needs to be placed so that it's only accessible to the individual carrying it. So not on a purse, not in the glove compartment of your car. Uh, I do have an off-body gun that I carry in my car. I actually have a little holster right under my steering wheel. So if a guy tries to carjack me, it's right there. But you can't even grab it from the driver, the passenger seat. It's, it's under my control. Uh, don't just throw it in the glove box. Don't just throw it under a seat. Don't just toss it in a drawer someplace. It needs to be controlled. It needs to be under your control. You are responsible for whatever happens to that gun or whatever happens with that gun. 
When you're storing a firearm, it needs to be unloaded. That's when it's not available for immediate use. Keep the ammunition and the firearms separately. Some answers for that are safes, lock cases. I'm gonna start to push through these pretty quick um, so that we can do that. Your key thing though is store a firearm so it's not accessible to unauthorized persons, okay? Small children are present. Firearms should never be left where they can come into contact with them. They should be unloaded, hidden from view, and locked at all times when they're not in use. When not in a gun safe, firearms and ammunition should be stored separately. And up in my truck, I forgot to bring them down. If anybody needs a gun lock, I have gun locks up there for you guys. They're all through Project uh, Child Safe. Some acceptable storage solutions are a gun safe, a lock drawer, or a lock gun case. This is an example of a gun safe that you can put on your nightstand. It has an access lock that you, it's not, it's not biometric, it's tactile. It, it's a handprint so you can feel where you're putting your hands. Pops open, it's open silently, it has a light on the inside. So my, mine that's sitting right next to my bed within... You don't have children running around the house, so it's not as, as vital. If you had little children running around the house, yeah. This is a gun case. It's less secure. The whole case can be stolen, uh, whereas the little safe can be bolted down to the nightstand or the wall. This can just be grabbed. If it has a chain or a lock on it, that can be cut. Usually only has one locking mechanism, a combination, or a key. Great means of transporting a firearm, but not necessarily a good answer for, for long-term storage. Gun locks. By uh, law, all firearms sold in the United States must come with a gun lock. If you buy a used gun and it doesn't have one, call the manufacturer. They'll send you one. Go to the police department. They'll send you one. Call me. I'll give you a lock. National Shooting Sports Foundation sends me cases of locks to give out to people. Uh, a child is going to figure out where a key is located if you have one. Try to hide chocolate from them sometime. Uh, a child is told to never touch will be more curious than one who has been instructed in safe gun handling. Children as young as eight years of age can be taught to safely handle a firearm. I've had very young children out there shooting. Uh, consider getting your children involved in the Eddie Eagle program. Teach them to stop, don't touch, leave the area, get an adult. And never underestimate the power of peer pressure and the effects of children other than your own. Just because you do everything right at home doesn't mean that Johnny's dad does down the street and he may come into contact with a gun at that house just because it's not yours. It only takes a fraction of a second for a horrible tragedy to occur. And I'm going to be harsh here. If you leave a gun where a child can get their hands on it and an accident occurs, you have murdered that child. And I hope you rot in hell and in jail. There's no excuse whatsoever for stupid gun handling that results in the death of a child. And I hope they bury you. And I will testify at your trial that I was very strong on this. Don't do it.